What are you doing over there, Han? Opening a candy bar or something? Every time I uh, come to sit down at the desk for this podcast, there's new candy for me to eat <laughs> that Samantha leaves behind. All right. Well, that makes sense. I'm like, it's all this crunching noise in my ear. <clears throat> Coming on. I'll, I'll be sure to, mi to minimize the crunching. <laughs> Are you going to be at Jacksonville, Dave? I'm hoping to. I've been in every one, so I'm hoping to. I don't know yet. Me and Tone have talked about it, so I'm not sure yet. The right spring on. is the absolute worst time for me to travel because when I do the most things here. Well, yeah, the weather's getting better. Yeah. yeah. Virginia ticket. I love landscaping, so for me, it's like that's my one you know, window of opportunity to do what I like to do. So. Yep. Mm hmm all right, we got a few people on. Let's get this. Warning. If you're faint of heart or easily offended, this show is not for you. I don't give a damn about what you're saying, bitch, you in the way. Closed case. My nigga could beat the charge just like yesterday. In your face, I'm going to go hard and make sure you see the cake. Keep the pace. Ain't no one fucking with me. This not a break. Doing the shit that I want. I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to give in. Making my way to the top. I told you to ride. I told you to get in. Now you can't eat out my pot. It's filled to the top. And I'm about to dig in. You say I was doing you wrong. Hello and welcome to the Go Rogue Podcast. I'm Roger Stout. This is Hans Berquist. And this evening we are joined by dave wilson let me shut my messages off the uh founder of razor's edge american bullies welcome to the show thank you thank you hey uh, let me let me start out by apologizing to you all and your viewers for last week and the miscommunication there on my my part so i i know i was supposed to be on wednesday and i thought it was thursday so you know i apologize for that to everybody who thought i was going to be on that night uh, no big deal uh that's we in the figured, past. We figured there was a mix up. So, yeah, no big deal at all. So, uh, yeah, not too long ago, we had talked on the phone a little bit and uh, we kind of got into a subject of breeding. And, you know, it turned into a conversation that I felt like would be a good conversation for us to bring to the podcast and kind of share information uh, with people. And I think, uh, you know, from what I was picking up from you is like your breeding style, say, back in the, in the nineties versus your, I wouldn't say necessarily your style, but your philosophy uh, really hasn't changed that much, even though the dog itself has changed, but your goals continue to be the same. So uh, just kind of run through it. Like what's your philosophy of breeding? Like what's your goals? What are you trying to do every time you're, you know, you plan a breeding? Well, every time I plan a breeding, obviously I'm trying to produce what I feel is, the best representation of the breed. Um, and, you know, I've always felt that this is a breed that carries extreme traits, but it's also a functional, structurally correct breed. So I'm always trying to create exactly what the essence of the breed is with what I aforementioned. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, like you mentioned the difference from like the 90s and now, I mean, there's big differences in the breed because from 1990 to 2004, I was breeding the American Pitbull Terrier. Yeah. And from 2004 to present, you know, it was the American bully. So we are looking at two different breeds. However, my breeding philosophy and tactics were always the same. If you date my advertisements back in the early 90s, you would always see that I was saying putting the bull back in terrier or, you know, like terms and, and slang terms that was basically saying we're breeding for a bullier style dog with more extreme features, even in the American football terrier, you know, at my, one of my slogans was a head above the rest or where females outdo other kennels males. And, you know, like I had mm -hmm. all these different slogans. So in my early days, I was a breeder that focused primarily mm -hmm. on females. Um, my, mm -hmm. my idea the whole time was that if I could produce very masculine looking females, then I would have mm -hmm. good males mm -hmm. to follow. So I was a, a breeder always looking for, very masculine traits on a female and my yard and everything was based around females. Um, you know, I've told people over the years that a breeder's yard is very different than just the average person's yard. When I'm selling a dog, I want the dog to be a correct version, something that it could step in the show ring with if it's a show quality dog that I'm, I was selling or offering. But as a breeder, I always had to keep different types of dogs in the yard 
because you need dogs going in different directions in order to pull certain traits. So I use the term overdone. Um, for me, overdone sometimes is interpreted as extreme. I, I don't like to use the word extreme because I've always felt extreme traits were supposed to be in the breed. It's an extreme breed in comparison to a lot of other breeds. And a lot of the features we are looking for are actually extreme features to put on dogs. So I like the term overdone because to me, overdone is when a dog has gone too far. When the traits, these mm -hmm. extreme traits have gone too far where they start to affect certain things with structure and other things that we all know you put too much on a dog, the fronts are going to turn. You're going to have various issues. But at the same time, as a breeder, you're going to need dogs with exaggerated traits, dogs that are overdone on one aspect, because when you're trying to pull in these traits, you sometimes need something that is above and beyond. I've always taught people that when you're looking for a trait, you have to go beyond the trait, because uh -huh. if you're saying, I'll give you a simple answer, you know, uh, thing is like, if you're saying, I, I want to increase the head size on the dog, you know, so you find the dog that has the head size that you want. And now you're, and this is a simple way of saying it. But you, you said, OK, so now I'm going to breed this dog with the head size I want to the female that I want to increase the head size on. But what happens in that case is you're getting something in the middle, you know, because you are on one end watering down that by using the dog that didn't have it. On the other end, you're increasing the trait in that dog by trying to use something that did have it. So in essence, you really need to go with something above and beyond what you're looking for. That way it's pulling it more that direction and not balancing out in the middle if you're trying to increase something. So in my yard as a breeder, even when I had pit bulls, I always had dogs that were above and beyond. I had overdone dogs that I would use to carry in some of the traits. And at the same aspect, I would have dogs on the other side of the equation. Very, very correct dogs. You know, maybe they weren't quite as overdone or whatever they were using for what I wanted, but dogs that I could always utilize to clean up. Um, so, you know, in my, you would come in my yard and I would have more brood quality dogs than I would have had show quality dogs because at me as a breeder i want to put the show quality dogs out there to the public so in my own yard i needed basically the rest of creating these dogs so i was always a breeder that had more brood quality dogs in my yard and brood can go both ways it can go overdone and it can go the other way where it's not carrying quite enough of what you were looking for whether it's mass head whatever whatever that trait is you know so um and that's you know my philosophy of breeding has been that way the whole Breeder, I need to come both into the equation. And at the same time, I'm always pushing the boundaries. When we as the American bully breeders began, um, we were all pushing the boundaries. And, you know, anybody that says contrary is lying because every popular dog throughout history has always been that dog that kind of pushed the boundaries of, of the extremities. You know, so I've always been a breeder that pushes the boundaries. The breed was created by pushing the boundaries. We were trying to create something with as much mass, head, bone, muscles that was, you know, that we can have without affecting structure, without affecting mobility, without affecting functionality. So it, that's really the essence of how the breed was created. All right. Yeah. And that, uh, cause you had mentioned, you know, we, uh, we're, t we're talking and you had mentioned, uh, using Oscar and a lot of people were like, why in the hell did he do that? You know? So I think that it made that obvious that that kind of, for some reason, that concept of using a dog as a tool kind of escapes people. Like right. they have to use the show dog, even though the show dog's not necessarily going to add enough to, you know, they not going to add enough of what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And, and Oscar, I mean, you know, Brian, uh, he, he will say the same thing. He's an overdone dog. He's not a show dog. He's overdone. And, I chose a female that was very strong in certain structural traits that he went overboard with. I, I actually chose a female that wasn't even too slight in bone or anything like that, because I, I don't think that's necessarily the bone that's too much and some other things that are, are, are outside of what a show dog is. So, but I chose a dog that I knew I could pull in the extremities that I wanted mm -hmm. and had a female that would still pass on dogs that were going to be correct and standard and, functionality and movement and as you can see i mean i would say out of that litter of eight uh six of them are show quality dogs mm -hmm. um one of them is, is overdone and one of them it's just to me just you know wasn't what what just was a, a meal yeah. you know but out of six out of eight what i wanted is a pretty good ratio you know it worked out the way i wanted that dog you just put up um that dog is in it's that photo is five months old he's in russia right now 
Um, just really started his show career. I mean, he's a good looking dog right there. You know, that's that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And then there's beautiful. He's a female yeah. out of the snake breeding four months in that video right there. You know, I mean, you can see her front is good, good, nice and straight. I mean, these are very confirmation of correct dogs, you know. But again, that's the style of breeding I do so that I can create. There's a male. Uh, I don't know if it's the male or female. It's the male. Another male from the litter at four and a half months, I believe. So Man. this is what I was aiming to do. I was aiming to create dogs that are going to be able to enter the show ring and be correct to the standard. But, you know, obviously carry a unique look to it that I felt is you know, the look that I like, which is within the standard as well. Um, and you know, that's the type of breeding I did. And you see the, I mean, I don't care really what people say. You can see the outcome of what it is. And it's yeah. the practice I've been using since the beginning of time. So in both, mm -hmm. breeding, you know, now it seems to be that, you know, I don't know when this happened. I don't, because, you know, I mean, realistically, I, I haven't been in the breed long enough to have experience back in the days to know, but you know, your philosophy and is kind of the same philosophy as I have is, you know, we're going to use tools and we understand that we, when we look at a dog, it, if it's overdone or if it's an extreme dog, it has value. If, it, if it's, it's potentially a slightly underdog dog, done dog, it has value. But uh, there are there are a portion of people in the community that don't feel that way. Um, and of course, you know, there's always the next dog that comes out drama. They're going to find something wrong with it and try right. to Tear the dog down. What, when do you think now? Was it always that way? Was it always like there was a separation of like only a few people felt like you know these extreme dogs were tools when the, and other people didn't? Or did so? Where did we deviate from that plane? You know, that, that's hard to say because you get tools on both ends of the equation, and it, you know, history shows that the dogs that tend to push the boundaries, the dogs that tend to be a little more excessive were always the dogs that people would spend more money for. They're always the dogs that tend to get more of the, the spotlight. Um, you know, and that's just the way I, it's always been. I, don't know, I think people tend to lean that way uh, on dogs, but as far as the people so hard on one side or the other, it's difficult to say because during our days in the UKC, you know, I mean, we had a period of time when the, the dogs that I bred for were were wanted and or were winning and doing well. And there was a period of time when they changed the standard and isolated that type of dog. And you got that other wave of the more terrier style people that moved in and, and felt that was the breed. And in our world, long period of time, this is I'll step back into something in the early days of ABKC, the early days of the American bully. And I say early days, I mean, more 2004 to 2008, 2009. Most of the dogs that were being created and most of the dogs at these shows were not the ring dogs. There were very few dogs in the ring during this period of time. If you would go to some of the bigger shows back in the day, I'll use uh, Bully Palooza was a great one to use as an example. That was in Atlanta. Um, Chaz threw that show every year and it was an ABKC show. But if you went to the event, I would say 80 percent of the dogs at the show weren't ring dogs. People came to see the dogs and the booths and see what other breeders mm -hmm. had, see the American Bully. Most of the rings were filled with average 30 dogs. You know, that was most of your ring exposure during that time. Even at a, a mega event like that, you weren't having a big ring turnout. So I think something along the way when, when the breed really got more popular in the ring and outside of just the booths and all of that is when people just started to become very critical and you got a lot of different ideas and things coming in and, and interpretations of a standard and things like that. So I think that world became more divided when the show side of that world picked up and, and became the main focus of all three, which is nothing wrong with that. I mean, the, the show side really should be the main focus. And to be honest with you, the best dogs should be the show dogs. But I think, there's a lot of people that have missed the essence of what the American bully is. And the American bully again is a dog of extreme traits. I mean, all of us are breeding. You, you, nobody's not breeding to get, a, a, you know, a nice size head on your dog. Nobody's breeding to not have exaggerated muscularity and, and right. bone. nobody's breeding to not have those things. Right. Breeding to have those traits, but have those traits on a dog that is still functional that the mobility is still correct to the standard, that the structure is still correct to the standard. So it's just a fine line that people argue over because sometimes they're using the terms wrong. 
Sometimes they're saying uh, extreme when and they're using that term to mean something that is overdone and beyond acceptable or what's acceptable within the standard. So for me, it's difficult to say when that happened and why that happened, but <laughs> because once the dogs became the ring became more popular, that is when the, everybody's eyes started to focus more on it. And sometimes it's easier at well, all times. It's easier to produce a dog that doesn't have any of the issues with mobility, structure, and all those things that is lighter in substance, lighter in bone. It's very easy to produce that style of dog. It's very difficult to produce a dog that's carrying these traits, but still right. doesn't affect the other things that I mentioned. So to breed the true American bully is actually a difficult task. It's not an easy task because we're asking, we're asking for a breed that is carrying all these traits of mass, bone, substance, whatever way you want to word it, but still still be correct to mobility, structure, mm -hmm. function. So we're, we're actually asking for a very difficult breed to create in its essence of exactly what we're looking for. Right. And and the sample size, even 20 years later, of dogs that kind of fit that description is, is still pretty small. You know, yes. overall, you know, yeah. we have like a million dogs registered now, you know, and then in reality, you know, how many do we see in the ring that we say, very closely or close to perfect fit that picture the numbers are they're fairly low i mean look at it like this the dogs that actually fit those dogs end up being the top winners all the way through they're the top <clears throat> number one dogs nationals winners you know like it's very easy to see those dogs because those dogs when you finally do it right they achieve the top level of competition that you can achieve right when uh when do you think we've created the consistent American bully. When do you think that'll be? It's difficult. And the reason this is difficult, number one is because of what I said, it's a difficult breed to do correctly. Number two, you have the element of social media where many people will spend a ton of money on a dog that goes beyond that or isn't correct for that. Mm -hmm. So you have that element that's always fighting against it because you have a lot of people that are going to say, why am I trying to go so hard to breed something so perfect and correct to the standard when I can sell this dog for X amount of money on social media because he's got this. It's like the, 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 the time frame of when the consistency will be there with the breed is very difficult. I mean, you have a lot of other elements. Like I said, unfortunately, on social media, you can sell anything and the more extreme it tends to be the more profitable in many ways. So that's one element fighting against the consistency. You have other elements of all these other registries popping up that have their own versions and their own standards and, you know, their own things. So then that takes away from the consistency. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult thing to say. And I mean, eventually you will have breeders that breed consistently for that. And you will see those breeders excelling in competition when that's going to be the case. I don't know. I mean, we've all been to dog shows and we do see the progress. I mean, I, I you know, people can say whatever they want to say, but if you look at, the show ring 10 years ago, five years ago, and today, you're seeing more and yeah, more dogs right. starting to have the consistency of what we're saying. Not right. necessarily you're seeing the best representations or ones that aren't carrying a lot of the flaws, or, but you're finally starting to see when you're looking at the breed type of the dogs, phenotype and all these things, you're starting to finally see, we do see consistency now. So we are progressing. And from somebody in my aspect who's been in this for 30 years and ABKC started 2004, I've been watching it the entire time. So I do see progression and I do see consistency coming, but it is a long way off. And there's still a lot of variables against it that are going to make it very difficult because again, people are breeding for different purposes, you know, and not everybody's breeding mm -hmm. to have exactly what the standard says. And I'm, yeah. I'm not really sure when it happened, but I remember seeing some older videos where, you know, I, I think it was, I saw some pictures, maybe you had shared with me and a couple other people mm -hmm. had shared with me. And the dogs were actually closer a long time ago to today's dog than they were. There was like a middle period where the dogs got a little less bully. They started, I guess, because you had mentioned before some other interviews that I had, you had done that you said something about people got a little overly focused on the structural part of things and the dogs started to lose a little bit of mass. Now, you think obviously that's starting to go the opposite direction now. People are starting to really add on. Yeah. So 
One thing I'll start with is if when I go back and actually look way back in time, when the perception is different, um, you know, even way back when we began, there weren't any dogs that were really that great. When you look back, you can always count every year, you know, five to 10 dogs every year that were like people were chasing like that's the dog. Um, so it wasn't that they were closer to that and then it lost it. What happened was way more dogs entered, you know, as time goes on, there's way more dogs in the breed, period. You know, so the, the amount of dogs is that way. In the ring, what happened is we got to a point that we were very, very critical on every single flaw that we started to flush yeah. out dogs that still had the phenotype of what we were looking for and started to have the essence. So it's very important when people talk about things like breed type, I think that's misinterpreted because the actual term breed type is a whole bunch of different elements that identify a breed as unique right. to itself. So, and that and movement and other things are part of that, you know, but what we're really referring to is like the phenotype. The phenotype is basically mm -hmm. the look of the dog, the way the dog is supposed to look. We're removing some of the other elements of things and we're just looking at how the dog is supposed to look. What's that phenotype of the dog? And when we got very critical on every single flaw, we started to lose the phenotype of the dog because it's way easier to bring in these dogs that, that are, are less bone, less mass and all these things mm -hmm. and not have these other flaws. But the biggest problem with that is they're, in my opinion, and of ABKC is that those dogs are actually lacking one of the most important traits of the breed. If when you read right. the standard of the breed, I mean, how many times does it mention bone and substance? And, and mass, and right. And mass, it, it mentions it over and over and over again in every aspect. So by not having dogs that don't have that don't have those characteristics in it's a bigger flaw than so many other flaws because if your dog doesn't look like what the breed is supposed to look like, this is a flaw, a huge flaw. Right. If the dog doesn't look like what the variety is supposed to look like, this is a huge flaw because you first need to be able to look at a dog and identify it. What makes a breed unique is that you can look at it and see this is something different than other breeds. This is what makes this breed its own unique breed. Same when you get down into varieties. So if you can't look at a dog and identify the uniqueness of the dog by certain traits and, and the phenotype of the dog, that's a bigger issue than everything else because now you have a dog that doesn't even look like what the breed's supposed to look like. So I feel that that is the most important thing first because first you need to look at a dog and be able to identify the dog. The dog should have the phenotype of the breed. And the phenotype of the breed, elements of that are in what is called breed type. Talk about silhouette and head and all these other elements. Right. That's part of that, you know. So those are very important because those are what identify your breed. If we lose that, then we've lost the identity of the breed and it's pointless. So, you know, it's one of these things that, yes, all of these come into play. But when you read a standard, those things are listed in the phenotype of the breed, the breed type characteristics of a breed. These things are extremely important. Yeah what's written in the standard and those are the, the traits that identify the breed as its own unique breed right well that's in the uh that's in the beginning portion of the standard correct yeah the general Type. it's it's in the, the very general main, impression right the general impression and that's what i'm referring to but there are elements of it throughout every other thing as well mm -hmm. yes yeah it, it states it very clearly in the very beginning of the general impression of the breed that's why it's the first element of a standard because the general impression mm -hmm. is where you begin. And then you start to tweak everything beyond that. Right. So if you don't make the general impression. I like the way you brought that up because it's easier to explain that to in those, those right. terms because that's how the standard is written. So right. if you can't meet the very first criteria, general impression, then tweaking everything else at that point isn't as important because you got to meet the first characteristic first. Right. Then we go through everything else and we start to tweak. You know, and there's somebody threw up a question here, and we've seen this question over and over again. And you know, it, they would say, "Well, will the standards change?" And what we know is the standard has never changed. It's never changed. It's breeders' interpretation of the standard, what they bring to the ring, has has changed. It's upped, I would say. But really, I mean, as far as the wording is concerned, has it really changed that much? No, no. I mean, if you really read it from day one till now, I mean, other than prior to adding the varieties, once the varieties were added in 2006, I believe, I don't even know what year, so don't quote me on any of this stuff, but um, it, 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 it never changed. And there was only one uh, amendment to the standard, one, one revision, sorry, of the standard, and that was in 2017, 18, somewhere around there. 
And at that point, all that really did was take the extreme class and say, hey, you know what? We've been saying this whole time that this breed should have these traits. We don't need a class that has traits that the other variety should have, but allows for things that it shouldn't have. So there's no point in that. It just roll yeah. that into the pocket standard and, and yeah. Excel because they should have had these traits anyway. And all the other stuff that was there, we shouldn't have anyway. So it was more like eliminating the the negative side of that and rolling in all the, the attributes that the breed should have had. So really that was the only revision. And if you read everything else, it's all we really did was add more flaws, add more DQs. So basically when you start something in the very beginning, see creating a breed take goes through a process. And when you start it, you're bringing in brood stock. So when you bring in brood stock, you have a standard. It's a, it's a general standard of the breed generations later when it's not about brood stock anymore, when it's about breeding the breed to itself, at that point, that's when you need to tighten your standard. You need to get stricter on things. You need to make more things, more flaws, more, more DQs, all of these. You need to tighten your standard to a stricter type of standard. So in essence, the standard hasn't changed. It's just gotten stricter if you really want to look at it. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, we're going to roll back on one of those things that you had mentioned, but so the reality of it is, you know, the standard says the dog should have a blocky head, should have, a, you know, uh, muzzle should be one third the total length of the head, you know, the stop and all this stuff. Right. So every breeder and every generation starts to bigger, blockier head, more defined stop, shorter muzzle, you know. So it's not that the dogs of seven years ago didn't fit, you know, somehow it just changed. It hasn't. It's just the breeders are bringing more of what the standard is calling for to the ring. Yeah, yeah. And the traits that the standards calls for are way easily, more easily uh, accessible than mm -hmm. they were back then. Absolutely. And that's the biggest difference. Back then you, you had to search for, for a lot of these things. Now it's there, yeah. you know, and now the breed has a pretty unique identity back in those early days. There's not many people that can accurately speak on that because they weren't really there. But back in the earlier days, when you really looked at the breed, we were looking at more of a separation of bloodlines, you know, like your mm -hmm. your standards and your XLs actually were more of the Gotti and, and the butthead dogs. You know, when you got into your other part of your standards and your pockets, then you're still looking more of the razor's edge style dog. So there was a very big difference back in those days. And it was more a separation of the bloodlines. The breed hadn't blend together yet and brought all these traits that made it super unique to itself like we have today now now everything's blend, blended together and there's been generations of breeding and breeding of you know of of like dogs so now all these traits are more accessible you know and the consistency of the look is more more unique now and it's more available now and do you think um over the years there's been many uh popular dogs right and we get like they kind of get that what they call a popular sire syndrome where lots of breeders use the same sire it really gets a lot of that <clears throat> blood into the breeding stock that you think that is kind of helped push the dogs like you got a particular dogs that were popular and they brought particular traits and then that really kind of pushed the breed forward that always happens never to the level of dax um right I mean, it's what it, what it is like or just like Dex. The influence of, of certain studs and the popularity of certain studs always adds to the, the look of the, of the breed to some degree. You know, it's all within the standard, obviously, but it's, you know, to some degree. And, I mean, Dex is your perfect representation of that. I mean, that dog was probably the most influence, influential dog in the American Bully breed. Not necessarily all great, not necessarily all bad, but influential is in the fact of, it started to take on a look more of that particular style of dog. Right. And that happens every generation. It's just that one particular dog. And it was probably the most influential of all times for the example of what you're asking. But yeah, right. it happens all the time. You always get a dog that's popular and everybody chases this dog. And that's right. in every breed. It's not just in the American bully. It's every breed. There's always this dog that everybody, oh, this is the dog. And everybody starts chasing the dog. They all run, they all breed at the dog. And for a period of time, a lot of the dogs in a certain breed start to have a look of that particular dog because of the popularity of that. But that's that's all breeds go that way. But yeah, but it, it, that shouldn't affect the overall part of the breed. It still has to be a breed within its standard. It's just but you're always going to have that element that happens. Yeah. And yeah. 
one thing I wanted to circle back to is you had mentioned uh, about eliminating the extreme class. And we were kind of talking about that last week a little bit that we wondered if, like, not that we necessarily disagreed with the elimination of the extreme class, but what it did was essentially, even though, even though you said in words, Hey, what the extreme class represents should be represented in all the classes, not just in this class. Correct. But at the same time, eliminating the extreme class, we, we felt like gave some people in the community some ammunition to say, this is the kind of dog you shouldn't use. The ABKC got rid of it. We shouldn't be using it. Obviously they stopped coming to shows at that point. Um, and I wonder, did, could that have not, not saying it was a bad idea, but could it have affected in a lot of ways, people's perception of these more extreme dogs as tools because of the elimination of them in the show ring. I mean, we're pretty early at that point, 10 years ago, they were still brood stock dogs and can technically those were brood stock tools. So yeah, you're a hundred percent accurate that it did affect things. And, you know, looking back on things, the reasoning for it is correct because the pocket standard and XL should look the way it should and should have the features and traits that it has. The reasoning behind it was definitely correct. The timing behind it, I feel now looking back was probably premature because we do not have enough dogs at that moment in time to do that. At the same time, like I said, we're building a breed. And breed, you know, breed there's, you're, you'll have people out there preaching that the breed is done and why we still have this or why we still have that. But the bottom line that is so inaccurate, that's that's actually somebody that doesn't understand how many dogs it takes in a gene pool to suffice or, or to, to carry a breed into the future, to have a breed that is still able to, to be around 100 years from now. You know, so if you if you eliminate too many things and you and you close the stud books and eliminate things in the stud books too soon, it can be detrimental in the future. You know, so you have to take your time with the breed to create a breed of 70 to 100 years before all of these things actually come into play. And every breed in history will tell you the same thing. I mean, I, I give the example all the time. The American Staffordshire Terrier came from the American Pit Bull Terrier, mm -hmm. certain strands, expert, ruffian, a few different strands. But they, they created it from those strains. And it still took them 70 years to develop a new breed off of one single breed that didn't have that many changes in it. So, and that's just a, a, an easy one to use. This breed take a hundred years or more. So you gotta be careful on eliminating too much or saying that, you know, that's like the classic, in my opinion, a classic has to be there. You have to have that because if we remove that element, the breed won't sustain itself a hundred years from now. The breed won't sustain itself 50 years from now. We right. need that element in the breed right now. We have to have that. And, and in order to have it, you should also offer competition for it. That's why we have mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. And the same thing goes to the, to the extreme. Yeah, I do feel now looking back that the concept was correct. The timing probably was premature. And, you know, we're, the, I think if I could have redone it, the idea would have been we should have taken the extreme standard and made more revisions to it to, to pull out all the flaws and say, okay, you can have these dogs, but the standard is saying you shouldn't have this, you know, the, the issues with, the, you know, that. Yeah. So, I mean, it is something that, that we as ABKC and the community have tossed around and thought about the idea, do we bring it back? Do we bring it back and fit it back within the <clears throat> guidelines that it should be, but bring it back in a way that is still confirmationally correct for what the breed should be, but emphasizing more on these traits? Or do we stick to the guns and say, we did it. We need to start seeing breeders breeding more and more and more towards it. It's very difficult because what's happening is yeah. – so many people go the other way. They're like, I, I, why am I doing it? There's no point. I can go over here and show this dog. I can sell my dog on on you know social media. I can do all these things. So, you know, why why am I going to try to create this really flawless is the right term? And I've heard people say there's no such thing as a flawless dog. That's completely inaccurate. There's no such thing as a perfect dog because that's an opinion mm -hmm. perception. Flawless are just things on a standard. You can make a flawless dog. I mean, there's plenty of flawless dogs in this world. So. Um, but, you know, looking back on that, I mean, it's something that you have to look at and say, you know, should we bring it back? Should we bring it back in a way that that fits within the criteria of everything else we have and, and give it more time to have 
to have its its place in the breed, just like the classic has its place in the breed? Right. Or did we make a decision that we need to say, you know what, maybe it was premature, but we got to do it. It's hard. It's a, it's a, it's hard to know what is right in these elements because you you are seeing it. I mean, you are seeing dogs now that that have it. Um, you have a dog yourself. You've talked about your dog many times, and I'm not. I don't know if you want me to speak yeah. on your dog or not. So yeah. that that's yeah. Right. yeah, you're fine. So when you look at your own dog, you know what's wrong with your dog and what's not wrong with your dog, right? So when I look at your dog, when you're looking at phenotype and the look of the dog. That's what it's calling for. There's, there's no way you can take your dog and look at that dog and say, that's not what the standard is describing. Now, when you get into every aspect of it, like I said, once you get past general impression and then you start to get into every other element, finding the flaws, then you're going to start picking out flaws with your dog and say, OK, it's here. And some of these things may be too severe, may not be too severe for for the ring, for a judge. You know, it's hard to determine. You know, is this too severe of a flaw? Because let's be quite honest. 90% of what we're seeing in the ring has flaws or more, you know, has flaws. And so we, we aren't dealing with a, a breed where the majority of the breed is flawless. Not even, you know, I mean, not even a percentage, you know, we're talking a very small percent, you know, um, and even we're still way too early. In, and I'm sure we can all pick out flaws on almost every dog out there in the ring right now. Absolutely. But, it, you know, it's difficult because, you know, your dog, your, your dog, in my opinion, obviously is the stack off king. I mean, he's won every stack off, every, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't deny that. And even in the ring, he's a title dog that's achieved the grand champion title. So when you're looking at your dog, he has the phenotype of what we're talking about, but there's other things with the dog that are still considered flaws. And some are going to consider that too much of a flaw to award. Mm -hmm. And some are going to say, hey, you know what, it's so much better with everything else that we should be overlooking this. And that's a hard, that's a very hard thing because until you have dogs in the ring that all fit the general impression and then all go down the line and don't have any of the, at least the severe flaws and all these other things, then, then it's very easy to say at that point, no for this or no for that. But it, when you're looking in a, an imperfect motion, it's very difficult to, to figure out what can we push forward and what can't we push forward, you know? Right. And it's it's hard because the standard doesn't say you can't award a dog with flaws. It's right. saying it should be this. And ideally, it should be a flawless dog. Ideally, it should fit general impression and then none of the flaws, you know, and that's what the breed should be. But obviously, we all know we're all honest, regardless of what people believe. We all have to be quite honest. When you look in the ring, you're not seeing general impression and then all the way down, not carrying any flaws. We're not seeing that. No. So, you know, it's a thing. So back to what you were saying. Uh, yeah, because as you've seen, many of the dogs that are of the extreme variety or the style, phenotype, however you want to word it, are not going in the ring and they've moved on to either another ring where they're accepted or with, and like I said before, that hurts because it just separates everything. and You'll never have consistency that way. Mm -hmm. Or or they've just stepped back in. They're just like, you know, I'm not bringing this here. I'm not bringing this here. So what what is the right answer? Is the right answer. You know, I think for ABKC, what we're doing this year, um, which is this is a new topic that nobody's discussed yet. Uh, Tone was the first to talk about it. We are definitely going to bring back the fun show elements uh, for these extreme style dogs that are ABKC registered, of course. Yeah. But we're going to give a, a bigger spotlight to that so people can start to see these dogs. At the very least, you can see what's available out there nice. to bring mm -hmm. in treats that you need in your dogs. You know, so... We are at at least that point in time where we're saying, you know what, we are going to bring this this element back for the extreme and the fun show so that because it is part of our breed, regardless, it's a registered, you know, ABKC American Bully, you know, that is carrying and a lot of them carry the phenotype of what we're looking for, but are probably too flawed up in other areas where maybe they're not a show dog, you know. Right. Well, I mean, but you know, at the end of the day, you have people that are coming to a show and. Well, let's look at it two different ways. One, we're going to talk outside the show ring, right? There is, without doubt, I can name 10 dogs and bring up pictures, and these are the dogs people want. This is what they want. This is what they want. They want to buy puppies off of that. This is, you know, this is what they want, period. Then you got the show side of things, right, where there's a little more demand for correct. There's a little outside the ring. Maybe there's a little less demand for that correctness, right? But right. inside the ring, 
So really what happens is the community creates a dog and then somebody that shows dogs says, you know what? I really like how that dog looks, but I need to fix what's wrong with it so I can bring it to the ring. So they frequently oh. use that tool that's outside the ring to create a new generation that they can bring inside the ring. So it just confused me as why those dogs aren't there in the first place. Like if I'm there showing and a judge says, you know what, your female is a little bit lacking. Like she could use some more shoulder set. Maybe her head's wrong. Those tools, those breed stock tools should be there at the show for you to find. You shouldn't have to go to the internet there. The dogs are there. You can go over and see that extreme dog in his booth and say, okay, well, this dog is extreme dog. He has an amazing rear and my female is really lacking in a rear. So you can see that dog. He may not be a good fit for the show ring per se, but at least he's there for people to see and consider using. And, and see, that is where a lot of these terms blend together because people use the term show, they use the term thing. Confirmation ring, that part of a show is for the dogs that should be confirmationally correct right. to the standard. The show, the event is a different thing because as a host, you're having an event and your event, you can offer other elements that bring in more of the breed for people to see the breed. So we're looking at two different things that should come together at an event. You, we can't really say in the confirmation ring, we need a place for this because if the standard doesn't call for this and it's not proper to the standard, then it's really a confirmation dog, you know, because it's not complying with the confirmation standard. And that's what a confirmation show is. However, if you're looking at the total event, you know, the whatever else is going on, the booths, the people that are there, the fun show elements and all of these things. That's another side to the event that should, in my opinion, be more welcoming to every element. Because really, if I was going to a, a, an event like that and I didn't know what, I want to be able to look around. I want to watch the ring and see what's what is confirmationally correct, what's the best out there for that. But I also want to look around and see you know, what's available, what do we have, you know, what other breeders are working with and everything. So it's a fine line because ABKC sanctions the confirmation part of the show. We don't host the show. Right. The show host uh, are hosting the show. So we as ABKC are taking a stand this year and saying, you know what, open your event up. We are going to allow you to go ahead and have other parts, elements of your event that highlight within, within the ABKC registered breed. Right. Yeah. You know, so we're pushing for that a little bit more so that number one, you get more attendance at the show. Number two, you get more people that can come out and see the entire, breed, of, you know, different dogs that they can work with. And, you know, so we're trying our best to bring all that back together. We had that in the very beginning. We we actually were founded that way when we started ABKC. The event was a huge part of what we were doing. Like I told you before, Bully Palooza is an example. 80 percent of the breed was at the event, you know. 20% was in the ring, you know? Um, so it's difficult because we're talking two different things. We're talking shows and events and confirmation ring. Mm -hmm. confirmation. Yeah. So ideally all the dogs should have all of these things and be confirmation and correct. That's the ideal situation. Yeah. Obviously we're, we're very far from that right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's why we need to, to open things up. I know it was me and ABKC who took a stand at some point and stopped doing the fun shows, but I don't have to dip back into that. That was, because of an incident that happened in Miami. Mm -hmm. And it was a fun show for dogs that were not ABKC registered. Yeah. That was something completely different. And that part of the event lost control. And it turned around and affected the everything else that was going on there. It put people in danger mm -hmm. and everything else. So at that point in time, we're the, we need to stop this because this is this obviously became a problem, you know, and a huge problem, you know. Yeah. Um, and a safety issue. But now after rethinking, it's like, you know, we need to be clarity on it. Mm -hmm. We should right. offer these things, but for the dogs that are ABKC <sighs> right, at these right. events. And that's what we're we're doing. So this this show that uh Tone is throwing in um uh Jacksonville. Jacksonville. He's going to have the center, he's gonna have two confirmation shows, open the center ring, like a halftime show for for the fun show for the extremes and then go back to the final two confirmation shows. So it's not something that's going to be pushed over in the corner. And, you know, it's something that will right. still be on your stage. I believe Ian Cooper is doing it at some of his upcoming shows this year. And I'm sure other people will jump on board and, and, and do that as well. Because if you're going to offer it, 
then you need to at least make it to where it's a value of the people entering, not just something off in the corner and we're getting, you know, whatever. It's something that's center stage. And so we've come to the idea that at this year we're going to do, we will allow certain events to have this, you know, you run your two confirmation and then those will break and you'll have this in the center ring and then you'll run your final two confirmation on a four show event, you know, so we're trying our best to, to bring all these elements in so that bringing the community back to be together. And, and a, a lot of these breeders miss this because you got all these breeders that are there and they got great dogs, but their dogs that they still need other things. So you're, you're missing out on so right. many dogs that, that you have traits that you could be using, you know, if you don't see them in mm -hmm. person, you know, and we all know how social media and everything is, everything can be edited and, you know, whatever, you know, Manipulated, yeah, manipulated absolutely. And, and, and unless you screens. see the Good. pardon, yeah, well, well unless, unless, unless you see it firsthand, you don't know. Right. You know, I, I've been accused of that recently with a dog yeah, game, dude. and you know, I'll yeah. say it now I purposely played the game on purpose just because I wanted to see what would happen if I just put a dog photos and never the video, never the dog, just because I wanted people to see that that's the way it goes. But in the end, I'm bringing the dog out in person, in the end, I start submitting videos and all of that, you know, but I, I wanted to, you know, to see how that worked for a minute and I got to see how that worked. So, but again, everybody wants to see the dog in person, you know, so we need to get to ride an element where people can see the dogs in person. Yeah. yeah and I think there's, you uh, have to, a couple yeah. things need to happen. Number one, you know, when I, like I kind of shared our story and when we got started in American bully and so ABKC did two different things to us and sent us two different messages that, different times right yeah so when we first got started we brought our female we said this is a standard female i know she's a standard female i read the i read the standard i look at my female it looks like standard female to me right so we go to our very first show we put our female in the ring and uh what was his name i can't believe i forgot it i normally remember it but anyway he kind of walked around the ring a little bit and then he walked over to the judging table and he came back out and he said, your female should not be in this class. She is, she's not a standard. She's a classic. And I was like, what? And I was confused. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but you know, no argument. That's fine. We took our girl, we put her in the classic class and Hey, she did damn good that day. She did really good because at the time, most of the classics in the, in that class, and I remember my friend QK was there with his female she was a smooth dog. Like she had no extremities whatsoever. So, you know, my dog, she had defined shoulders. She had defined hips. She had a big head. You know, it seemed like to me that she was a standard, but she got moved and, you know, it took me a minute to accept it. But what that did, it's kind of set a precedent in my head. And I'm like, okay, this is not enough. If this is mm -hmm. not enough, then I need to add more. Right. So then I go about doing that and, then it seemed like when I brought more, well, what pe some people, I wouldn't say all, because there was a good majority of your judges were like, when I brought the next generation of dog to the ring, they were like, holy shit. Yes. You're like, we get it. You know, he's not perfect, but my God, he's carrying all of the phenotype that we want in the American bully. You know, he has that headpiece, the chest, the rib cage, everything you want, you know? But then another half was like completely appalled, didn't want anything to do with it, didn't want to pick it. People on the sidelines were taking pictures and posting shit on the internet and trying to tear the dog down. And people that breed more extreme dogs will was getting to the point where like, I'm not going to these shows anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I know my dog's a tool. I know what my dog's for. I, I'm well aware of what my dog is but I'm not going to bring him there and be subject to being attacked on Facebook, you know, which essentially hurts that dog's reputation because people can't see, you know what I mean? So right. it's awesome that we're bringing them back, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the people that are there, like start to understand, Hey, this, you know, these dogs are tools. It's not, you know what I mean? And I get what you're saying. Like, don't put them in the show ring. I think that probably goes a long way, right? Because I think when a dog shows up in a confirmation ring and people have a disagreement of what that dog represents is when they get passionate about it. So maybe just bringing them back for, you know, like stack offs and things like that may 
may be the, the best way to do it. But for me, I feel like you have those dogs in the ring, right? And, you know, I'm not a dog that can't walk around the ring, obviously, right? But those dogs need to be represented, and people in the community need to understand their purpose. As much as a classic has a purpose, so does the extreme. But a classic can go there, and you don't see guys taking pictures of classics and coming home and like, look at these damn pit bulls they're putting in the ring. No. No, you've never seen that post. Unless it beats a dog with more type. Yeah. Well, well, let, let I've me, seen that. I've, I've, I've seen it. it. Here's, here's where the catch-22 comes in, is that when you have a dog that stands out that much, that screaming phenotype, right? that's standing out that much, the, the, the catch-22 is the flaws are going to stand out even more because the dog itself is standing out even more. So when a, when a dog walks in that is phenomenally impressive as far as phenotype, it's really standing out. All eyes are on it. And at the same time, all eyes are on it more critical because it looks different than most of the things out there. That's why I'll always refer back to let's just I use three dogs, for example. Um, let's go with uh, Blue, Zero and Samson. Right. You have three dogs, very similar phenotypes, you know. With minimal flaws. So here you have these three dogs that when you look at the phenotype of these dogs, you're like, that that's what we're talking about. These are American bullies, you know? Absolutely. And then you, then you start to break down everything else, you know, and then there's very minimal things here and there. You know, they all have something, of course. Almost every dog right now has something. But they're minimal compared to everything else. These dogs make it all the way to the top, you know? But if you have one of those dogs out there and, it, and it's that much different than a lot of the other dogs in the ring it's really going to stand out there so then the things wrong with it also stand out so it's very difficult to have a dog that is very that's well, i don't know what the proper term is but physically you know type <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it's just an unfortunate thing the dog standing out period so every element of that dog is going to stand up right. um and it's hard because really we're, we're telling you that the best dog should be a dog that fits confirmation all the way through. Many people look at that and say, flaw, 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 but they ignore the very first part, the right. general impression. Right. So, you know, and, and, and it's hard when you have dogs that you're like, this is what the general impression says. This is what it's supposed to look like. But man, we got this, we got this, we got this. How can we award that? Because it's got things that are definitely wrong with it. The flip side of that is, how can you also look at a dog that that has all of these things down here correct, but is lacking the main thing that right. it's stuck with? So, right. and that's the unfortunate side of the breed in the ring at the moment. It's the unfortunate side because you're you're it's it's missing on so many different elements. You're not getting the consistency of everything together. You know, there was one year at nationals where I looked at the grand champion ring, and in the grand champion ring, I believe it was. Blue was in there. Zero was in there. Samson was in there. Samson's brother was in there. Um, and, and all of a sudden, I'm looking like, this makes sense. This is finally, we, we've we reached a level now where the grand champion class, and there were more dogs than that. Those are just the easy ones to, that people are going to know the names of. Uh -huh. you know? right. And I look back, I think, two or three years ago, COVID might have pushed it one more year. But um, anyway, now look at how, like, this is where we finally are. We finally got it, but we're talking five or six dogs that, that fit the general impression exactly, and then had very minimal of the flaws all the way down. And you, you don't see that all the time. And it's not something you're seeing at, at the majority of the shows right now. So it's, it's, an, it's we're in a, a trying moment in the breed because finally people are starting to, to get what the phenotype, the general impression of the dog really is, you know, and if we're finally getting that way, but we're still at a point where we're not making these dogs without all these flaws, or at least the, the what I call it like hard flaws or extreme flaws, things that you can visibly see outside the ring, you know, because ideally you, when you get into the dogs, you really, if a dog really is carrying stuff that you can see outside the ring, the hard flaws, um, those dogs shouldn't be awarded because these are severe things, you know, these are severe flaws. So it's just a hard moment right now because you're not seeing the best of all worlds combined, you know, right. and it's our job now as ABKC to figure out, how do we bring everything together so everybody can see what's available because they need to know what's available and where there are strong traits and other things to eventually get us to the point that we're breeding all of these things into one dog, you know? 
and and obviously this sounds like a pitch to just like hey use my dogs but that's not really what it is it's just what i believe and i believe that these dogs are a, uh, an important part of the breed they bring value to the breed as much as the opposite end of the spectrum um so there was something i was thinking there i can't remember what it was lost it um but you know i i get that as far as you know let's say well let's not bring them in to the show ring necessarily or we'll say the confirmation ring and i get that i get that part of it so i it's it'll be interesting to see what you guys uh come up with as far a stack off is pretty easy right a stack off is you we're, can we're, get we're, 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 we're not talking stack off we're talking judged by a judge you know the mm -hmm. the the dog so we're looking at something that is not mm -hmm. sanctioned but not just your stack off, you know, not okay. your, your, your crowd pleaser. So that's what we're actually, oh. Oh. So that, that takes you a step back that direction a little bit because it's still being judged and still being, yeah. you know, it's not a true confirmation standard, but we're still yeah. looking at the extreme dogs yeah. and yeah. we're still understanding what the you know, judge understands what the standards, you know, calls for. So we're, we're going more that direction with it, not just stacking mm -hmm. everybody up and whoever screams aloud as wins. No, that's not what we're talking about. Oh, it's just not a sanctioned part of it, but it's still, you know, it is what yeah. it is. It's still a fun show to this at this moment, you know. Yeah, and no, I, I think I love everything about that. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a it's a great way to control control it in a sense that um, moves the narrative to the direction of furthering the breed. Yeah. Uh, so, will there be a scenario where the dog is like? They come out for that particular. Well, I don't know what we'd want to call it. We still call it a stack off technically, but it's being judged. Um, what I mean, do we do we have a criteria? Do we say, okay, this is too much. We don't want this. Work, or, working on that as we speak. Okay. Um, working it's, on that. Uh, as we speak. Same kind of thing that we did. I mean, it's basically writing a standard, and it's basically having drawings and everything that back the standard to explain what we're looking for. So it's a process and how we use it is going to depend on, you know, how things go in the future. Is it something that is brought back because it's needed to be brought back? Or is it something that's utilized for an educational type of thing and, and opening up the breed to everybody? It's we're, we're, we're touching the waters of how we'll use it this year. Right. Um, okay. You know, and, and again, there's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of narratives that are saying the breed is done and you shouldn't be doing this, or you shouldn't have the, the classic and you shouldn't i understand all those things but we are the abkc we are the original registry for the breed we are the registry that wrote the standards that brought in the original brood stock that have had the stud book since the beginning of time it is our job as abkc to preserve this breed for the future to figure out ways so that the breed can become a complete full you know prosperous breed you know and that's what we're supposed to do so Sometimes we have to go back to the drawing book and say, we need to do something else. We need something else because something is missing. And if we don't do this now, it's going to affect the future of the breed. So right. whether or not somebody agrees with these things in another registry, that's not my concern. My right. concern as ABKC is to preserve this breed for the future and all the elements of the breed. And when we talk about dogs like classics, the classic dogs, they have a certain pur pur you know, purpose in our breed. You know what that purpose you know, those dogs really, aside from impression, those dogs should be tick every way down the standard. You know, I mean, they should tick everything because their purpose right. is to keep this breed functional. Their purpose is to clean up things when they've gone too far. Their purpose is to have the to, to, to aid in structure and all of these things. So the classic should tick every single thing, you know, should be very critical when judging and looking at a classic, you know. The breed itself is supposed to have extreme traits. We all know this. We all know when we're talking about, you know, all the different elements of muscularity, you know, and we can get into what all those things mean. But in generic terms, we're talking the extreme traits that identify this breed as an American bully, not a pit bull, not, you know, everything else. Right. You know, so it's supposed to have these things. And when we're talking about dogs that many say extreme, I say some are overdone, however you want to word it these dogs are excessive in these traits, you know, and again, those are needed in the breed because that is part of what the standard calls for. That is the general impression. It tells you when you yeah. get everything. So you need these things, whether certain dogs are confirmationally correct, that takes it to a different level. 
No, I mean, obviously when we get into confirmation, some dogs are going to be too far to be that way. And that's just what it is, but how we play it, it's difficult, you know, but I, I mean, I, I am admitting, I'm publicly admitting somewhere along the way, we've lost some of these dogs that need to be there in the breed that breeders need to use. And I personally feel that we move fast and, 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 and did the right things, but probably a little bit early, probably a little bit premature. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can see, we can see where that affects the breed. I mean, and where it affects events. I mean, it's obvious, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I think worth clarifying, because, you know, we see people like in the comments or like confirmation is key and like it is, but, you know, yes, but confirmation is first. Yeah. But they got to understand confirmation first. isn't just flaws. Confirmation right. is the entire standard, yeah. which starts with the general impression. Confirmation, you should take everything. If you want to be realistic about it, the dog first should fit general impression exactly to what it says. And then yeah. it should carry any of the flaws that is stating all the way down, uh-huh. you know, and, and it should fit every, you know, every, everything from that point on is just basically describing what the head should be, what the, what the movement should be, what the rear should be, what the top line should be. All of these elements of breed type that, you know, it's just explaining them. But ideally, ideally, your dog should hit everything, every part of that. And that's really what a confirmationally correct dog is. Unfortunately, people think, oh, confirmationally correct means that it's the dog with the least amount of flaws. General impression is the biggest right. thing to begin with. Then let's get into flaws. And yeah, ideally, it shouldn't have any of the flaws, really. It really shouldn't, you know. But we're a long, long way away from that. A long way. And, and when you're really, when you're looking at a classic to use in your program, and that's another thing I feel like people, when they say, oh, I'm going to use a classic, they're really going to look at a dog that moves really well, maybe has good turn to stifle, like good, you know, alignment as far as the way the dog moves, right? And they, for some reason, accept the fact that the dog doesn't have the headpiece, that, you know, there's right. a bunch of pieces and I feel like, no, if you're going to look for a classic, it should still have what is essentially that description of the American bully. This dog right. should have big cheeks and a good stop and all those things mm-hmm. required to be an American bully. But where it lacks is maybe mass and bone. Maybe it has a little bit. And, and it does, it, it does, it, it, it's not that it lacks it. It's that's what its standard calls for. That's what its right, variety right, calls for. Right. It's very, when you look at the drawings, it's pretty clear, you know, what it should look like. It's, we're not talking about a terrier. We're not talking about a pit bull. The classic isn't, we, the ABKC has the pit bull class. We have the American Staffordshire Terrier class. We right. don't have a classic class <clears throat> for that type of dog. We have a classic right. class because it's, it is part of the American bully. It is. And a lot of people say, well, that's the, the, the classic class was created for the original dogs. Yes. And no, it was created. The original dogs were created the classic class. Yes. But no, it's there for its purpose. And we all, we've already explained what its purpose is. And, a lot of times it's used as a negative, you know, and there's, it shouldn't be used as a negative. If you want a dog that fits the classic variety that's accepted in the American bully breed that's accepted in the ABK. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a negative thing. I've seen beautiful classic dogs that, you know, in fact, I've seen one female, I can tell you, and I don't remember the guy's name, but it was actually related to my dog demon. Um, I think third generation, but I would own that classic female. Cause to me, that was like, she was, gorgeous in every aspect you know? mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with it and a lot of times it's used a negative oh your dog's be moved to classic because of this mm-hmm. your dog's being moved to classic. you're not moving your dog to classic because it's not a caliber dog you're moving the dog to classic because its phenotype is of the classic variety right that's why it's moved to classic not because it's it's not a quality dog if it's not a quality dog it's not a quality dog no matter where you put it you know mm-hmm. so. yeah and i think um you know i've seen probably in 23 was probably a year that I really noticed the most was dogs that were in the classic class that had still had the you know physical characteristics of an American bully. You know, there weren't that, there were dogs that weren't, didn't really reflect the more terrible. Well, it, it is an American bully. That's, yeah. why, that's right. why I'm there. Yeah. So, yeah. so and it is a needed class. I mean, yeah. Argue all day long, but the, the arguments against it 
obviously aren't understanding the, the future and the preservation of a breed. And, you know, it's needed in the gene pool, especially at this moment, you know. Right. Now, uh, the other thing we had talked about, I remember when we talked on the phone, we had mentioned something about um, there was a subject about watering down. And w when you use a dog on, let's say, the more extreme side of things, your goal was not to necessarily water down that dog, but actually get his traits, not water them down to your female's level. And um, so and that and key in it is in that is that your female is close to what the standard calls for. Right. And you're just trying to add to her. But you have a so it would be a phenotype mismatch, in my opinion, to take a dog from maybe necessarily, I don't know, on the extreme end of classic and take it to the extreme end of the of the extreme dog. You know what I mean? Like your the result of that wouldn't very be very consistent. No, and, and I, I explained that one earlier, I think, because when I was talking about how I explain breeding and how I do breeding. Mm -hmm. And yet, yes, when you're trying to bring in a trait that your dog is lacking, you want to try to find a more exaggerated version of that because what's going to happen is it's going to water down. That is what's going to happen. That's why I use the very generic example of head size, you know, right. just because it's like this is the head size I want. My female doesn't have it. If you're breeding that female to the head size you want, you're probably going to get things in the middle because that's how it tends to be. Right. You know, yeah. the majority of it's not going to go this way and be exactly this head size because your dog is lacking it. So you're watering it down. So if that's what you're trying to do, you're trying to increase the head size. Then you need to go beyond your goal mm -hmm. because that's how you're going to balance it out and, and right. looking for very like the example of the breeding I did, the Oscar breeding, you know, I used the dog that was beyond what I was looking to produce, but I wanted those traits to come in. So I did it the way that I felt it would work. And it did. I mean, it's, it's, people can argue it all day long, but the proof is in the pudding right there. You know, you can look at, yeah. you know, six of eight dogs turned out exactly the way I wanted them to. And they weren't to the level of what Oscar is, you know, they're not Oscars, you know, and nothing wrong with Oscar. Oscar is what he is, you know, um, but that that's how you have to look at breeding. Cause in essence, when you're trying to add something, if you're going with a, finding something that has exactly what you want, you're still watering it down because obviously you're trying to put that onto your dog, you know? Right. So, yeah. No, and I think that's a good thing. I think this is a message that the community really needs to hear because I think they got away from, um, they got away from the focus on pushing toward that extreme. The dog disappeared and did they just honed in more on maybe structural and they said, okay, we're going to use this dog or this dog. And you know, that with that dog being out of the picture, I think it, it really hurt the breed. So this is, I, I think this is great. This is great news to hear. Well, uh, let's say they, they said, somebody said confirmation is key, right? Yeah. Key or King. I don't know which word they use. I think it was key. Key. That is a hundred percent accurate statement. Confirmation is key. Confirmation, confirmationally correct is breeding the ideal dog to the standard. That's what that means. Confirmation is the ideal dog. If you take a standard top to bottom and you check every single box, ideally, that's what the breed should be. So confirmation is key, but saying this part of this is more than this part of this is inaccurate. Right. You cannot say that. You can't say we're going to sacrifice the general impression of the breed, the phenotype of the breed, because we want to make sure our dogs don't have these other flaws. Well, you're wrong. What you should be doing is all of those things. You know, you should mm -hmm. never sacrifice the general impression because that's what gives your dog the unique identity of its breed and its variety. And at the same time, you should still always focus on the traits that are the correct traits, not the incorrect traits. So right. when people say confirmation is key, yes, it's a hundred percent true statement, but understand what you're saying. Don't just say mm -hmm. we don't want these flaws because not having the number one thing <clears throat> is a huge flaw, you know? So it has to begin and follow everything else. Confirmation is a hundred percent key provided that you're striving for every part of what standard calls for. Jack, when, we're, yeah. when we're talking about breeding, it's a little bit different because breeding is different. Breeding doesn't necessarily mean confirmation. Breeding should be mm -hmm. we're breeding to get 
the confirmation. Confirmation, the, the right. confirmation. We're breeding for that. So when we're talking about breeding, I don't want people to misunderstand me, but we're talking about breeding as a breeder. I am a breeder. So it, for me to talk, sometimes you're hearing Dave Wilson, a breeder. Sometimes you'll hearing Dave Wilson, ABKC president. It's two different right. entities here. You know, well, as a breeder, I understand to get this, you need things on, on both sides. You have to have it. That's why I explained mm -hmm. to you always my yard. If you had ever come to my yard, my yard was more breeding tools than the finished product because my goal was to sell the finished product, get it in the hands of the people and show them what the breed should be. My yard was what I needed to make that, you know, right. And that's okay. the, whatever and, tools you needed. Yeah. And that, but that you also have to understand that as a registry for a particular breed, that all of these dogs exist somewhere in, 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 in the breed. You have to have these dogs, you know, until the day there is so much, uh, uh, what do you call it? Conformity of everything until there's so right. all the dogs oh, starting to look the same, and you know, we have that until that day, yeah. But that day is how many who knows how many years down the road we're talking, you know, before you consistency is probably the best way to say that. Until the breed is so consistent that 90% of what you're doing is hitting because it's that consistent, then that's a different story. But that's right. no breed is ever that way anyway, to be truthful. But you know, that's, you know, maybe shepherds and not even that breed. But anyway, you know, certain breeds that have been around for hundreds of years, you might have the consistency, you know. I'm going to tell you what, Dave. Jack Smith has been asking been for about six months. Jack's on here? <laughs> yeah. If anyone can answer this question, that's going to be you. And I think he will be extremely happy that you can finally get the answer. <clears throat> he wants to know if we're going to incorporate ramps into the show ring. For dogs like the Pocket, English Bulldogs, Shorty Bulls, so the judge could evaluate the dog at a higher level. Uh, Jack Smith, no, we're actually going to have shorter judges. That's what we're looking to do. <laughs> 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 no, um, you know, you can use a ramp now. Um, we, we, we're not opposed to using ramps. Obviously, we implemented the tables for Frenchies and dogs like that. Um, when we get into, you know, I've seen English Bulldogs and AKC and FCI, which was their original homes, both ways. And I've seen shows where they're using ramps and shows where they're not using ramps. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good question. Um, and I think that uh, we're not opposed to it. It's not there's not a rule that you can't use a ramp for for the shorter breeds. If it's something that's going to be mandated, that wasn't something that was on the immediate agenda that we're looking at. It's definitely a topic to bring up. Um, but at the moment, um, it's, you know, if a judge re requests it and, and the host has it, the judge is welcome to use it. Um, but it's not mandated by any, any means. And at the moment, it's not something that was on our agenda to do. However, now that he's brought it up, it is a good topic to take internally. So yeah, there's your answer. Man, he's been wanting that answer for a while. There you go, Jack. <laughs> now someone had said, uh, in my opinion, you need a good classic to maintain the standard of the American bully. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I ideally, you don't want to need that dog. I, I, we've pretty much covered that topic already. Yeah. I mean, when a breed is that consistent, then you don't right. necessarily need the extremities on both ends. Right. But we're a long way from that, and it's 100% needed in the breed at this moment. And it's a hundred percent needed. Probably we're talking, f none of us will probably be here. Unfortunately, by the time it's not needed, you know, so I mean, until you, I'm, until I'm you no, see I'm, consistency in the show ring at all stages of competition, your class dog consistent, your champion class consistent, your grand champion class consistent, then, um, you would say that the breed is in the correct direction and the need for the classic style American bully isn't so essential. Ideally, what you're saying is correct. Whether or not it is proper to say we want to remove this particular variety is different because it is a variety that is, there's nothing wrong with this variety. Right. right. Um, I mean, it's, and it's in it's what I would look at it like this. The proper way to answer that is to say, at some point, does this variety become its own breed? That's the mm -hmm. proper way to look at it. 
And right. at, at this moment, definitely not. At this moment, I would never say the idea of removing the variety completely um, and not giving it a place at all is not correct because it is a beautiful variety of dog and there's nothing wrong with it. and there's plenty of people that love the oh, absolutely. American bully. So the proper way to look at it is, is there a point in time when everything has reached its consistency? Does that turn into its own breed and no longer part of the gene pool of everything else? Which you can also look at the other variety the same way. Is there a point in time when your three varieties separated by height become separate breeds? Like the, the Schnauzer, for instance. At one point, mm -hmm. you had the Schnauzer. Then you had the variety. Right. Now you have miniature Schnauzer, regular Schnauzer, giant Schnauzer. Three complete yeah. separate breeds. A couple hundred years of breeding and then separation and all of these things happened before they were separated at breeds. Does the American bully go in that direction into the future? Possibly, possibly a hundred years from now, our varieties are separated into breeds, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we are so premature. As much as all of us really want to feel like we're there, we are so far from being there in a breed. Where we're talking from 2004 to 2024 is what? How many years is that? My, my, 20 years. Yeah, yeah, I, I, 20, 20 years, years right? Yeah. And, and I explained from 2004 to 2008, it was still separated by bloodlines. You know, it wasn't even a really, a, truly a breed. We were still breeding different bloodlines and still tweaking, you know, what we were doing. So it's like the consistency of breeding a true American bully in its varieties, we're looking at not much more than 10 years. So these are things that mm -hmm. are going to have to, but again, this is the ABKC. So we do look to the future. We have to look to the future. When this torch gets passed on to the next generation of you know abk you know all that these things already need to be in place of what is going to happen 100 years from now and i do believe in 100 years or something maybe that the, the breed should be separated into separate breeds i think at that point in time we will have gotten there you have to take steps along the way since you have to find a way to properly identify varieties first you know and, and that right now can only be done once the dogs are mature you know yeah, and so right. you, you can't just say a dog is going to be a pocket. A dog is going to, you can't, you can't identify that until the dogs are mature right now because the breed is that closely related still. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is at some point put a gap between the variety saying, you know, that the pockets are three inches below the standard. You know what I mean? There's a three inch gap in between pocket and standard, a, a three inch gap between standard mm -hmm. and Excel. And what happens is now you're eliminating a bunch of dogs in this three inch gap right. that you know where to go. But that is a necessary, if you're going to separate as breeds, that's the first stage that you have to do. You have to first right. create more distance between the varieties. And then at that point, then it moves into the registration side of pockets can only be bred to pockets. You know, then this can only be bred to this. But even before that, they have to first be identified on their pedigree. So it's like, it's a long process and it's not something that can happen right away. People are like, well, can't we, you know, uh, register our dog as our variety now. Well, you could possibly do that after a year of age, but it's still right. not enough to separate that <clears throat> variety as far as the breeding and the genetic wise. So, you know, these are all yeah. future things that that I've thought about, and and internally in the ABK, we, the ABKC, we've thought about. And again, that's what makes our registry different because not only did we create it and founded it, but we have to figure out where it's going to be for the future. You know. Exactly. And these are long down the road things, but yeah, the classic one mm -hmm. day, in my opinion, probably should be, <clears throat> you know, but not 10 years from now, you know, right. And not eliminate it. No. Right. No, I, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, that's the one part of it is like, I've never, never really necessarily been against any, any class. I don't understand that conversation. Like I've never been pro eliminate the the classic class. It does it just doesn't make sense, you know. And I, I've told people on the show before and in person, you know, our job, even though we'd like to think that we'll see the finished product in our lifetime, but the reality of it is, is our job as breeders now is to build a solid foundation to hand off to another generation to continue mm -hmm. building on, and then eventually, we eventually there will be a finished product. And eventually someone will say, okay, now we're done. Like we don't need all this crazy variety. We need to stick pockets to pockets, <clears throat> just like you said. 
So that makes more well, sense. I think that's when that, the consistency is at every stage of competition. Right, cookie cutter. Right? Yes. Well, well, you just said right is, is a perfect way to say that. That that's hats off for saying that because that's exactly where we are today. And it is it is your job as breeders to it is your job as breeders now to breed towards consistency and consistency to be completely correct to it was mo most correct that you can be to a standard. And that's, that is your job now so that the next generation, we've already taken it to the next step. And, and we are doing this. It might not be publicly acknowledged because people are looking through a, a small window, but when you step back and you look at the whole thing, this is already happening. This progression is already there. A lot of these other registries and a lot of these breeders, they're breeding and, and registering and doing what they have today because these things have already been done. You know, the, the process has already happened. The movement has already happened. The breeders have been doing what they've been supposed to do, you know, to do exactly right. what you said. But obviously we're talking 20 years and again, not even true 20 years. So we're still in the infancy of where, where this breed is. And it's each breeder's obligation to try to breed a, a better dog and a more consistent dog to what the breed is supposed to be and so that the next generation can move on to the next stage, you know? So now somebody posted a question in there asking if you were going to broaden the pocket class uh, by allowing dogs a little shorter than the minimum at this point. It's it's a valid question. And it is a question that has been brought up. You have a couple things to think about, because if you broaden the height of a certain variety too much, then it loses its identity of its variety. Because now if you're, if you're looking at a dog that can be within a period of seven inches from top to bottom, then you don't have consistency again. Now you've lost consistency again because now you're, 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 going to, you're giving it you know, too much guidelines as far as its height. If you say, okay, we're going to take it down and we'll drop it down three inches, then what happens to that gap in between it and the other variety? It's too soon for that too. Now you're eliminating a ton of dogs out of nowhere that say, hey, sorry, but – you know, you're, you know, you fall within this three inch gap way too soon to be doing that. Right. Then there's that, that thing. Well, do we add another, do we add another category for it? Do we add this? Do we add that? I mean, and the bottom line is that's a difficult question because how far do you want the breed to go? I mean, how many versions of the breed do you want to have? You, have? you know, micro pocket standard XL, double XL, triple X. I mean, I mean, how far do you possibly want to take a breed and, and, and break it out into how many things? I mean, typically three is the way breeds normally go that in the future turn into separate breeds. So it's it's a difficult question. Just because somebody breeds it doesn't necessarily mean that we have a place for it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct. Just correct. because there's a group of people that like this or breed this it doesn't necessarily mean that you give it its own thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that some things are fads, you know. You know, so it, it's it's difficult, and those questions are difficult questions, and they are community based questions that that we watch. We watch the community because we are a community based registry, and you, you know, I mean, we need to pay attention to to the breed in its entirety. So I don't actually have the answer. To that. I don't know. Well, I don't think the answer is to, to to broaden it. I don't think it's to say, hey, we can give you another three more inches of you know. The, the, you know, from top to bottom. I don't think that's the correct answer. Well, to somebody who um, does breed those micros, um, I feel that the consistency is there, but it has to be generational, you know, consistency. Um, because you can take two pockets or standards and have an anomaly in the breeding and then try to place it in the micro class but there's no consistency in that, right? Um, well, you're so, right, you're creating something, but the, the real question is, is it necessary to create it? Just because you like it and you breed for it, does it necessarily constitute adding it? You know, that's where the real question comes in. What you're, <clears throat> what you're stating is 100% accurate. If you're trying to create something, you're trying to have right. a class for something, you need the consistency. 100% agree with you on that. The actual question isn't that. That's how you do it correctly. Right. The question is, does the fact that you and other breeders have it constitute us adding it? Does it mean so would, we should add this? That's the real question. It's like that there's there's this thing called no, the triple XL. There's many breeders that breed right. this dog called double XL, triple XL. There's plenty of breeders out and there's breeders that have consistency of it. Do we add the triple XL to the American mm -hmm. breed 
above and beyond the XL because we register them because they're all American bullies, Mm -hmm. but registering and having a confirmation class for showing are two different things. Registering is just pedigrees that determine that these are actually of this American bullies. Right. right, That's registration. Confirmation is displaying the actual standards, you know, the varieties right. and the standards. Absolutely. So I don't have the answer for that because in my opinion, you, you don't want to go too many directions with a breed. Right. Um, and that's my opinion. Like, I think you probably would agree if I asked you the opposite question. Do you think we should add the triple XL American bully right now? And probably if you're somebody on the end is going to say, no, I don't think we should do that. Same thing applies to do we add mm-hmm. the micro, mini, the micro, whatever right. you want to call it. You know, right. I don't know because I, I personally, my personal opinion is if you do too many things, then you lose your your breed's identity. Um, you know, if if that turns into a different breed and people are breeding for a different breed, that's a whole nother topic that you bring up. Mm-hmm. But then, the, then the, the same kind of question is, but they're all they're pure American <clears throat> bullies, talking an exotic. Mm-hmm. We're talking dogs that are actually American bullies but now are smaller than what they once were and consistently mm-hmm. smaller. Right. That's still an American bully. That's not a new breed. Right. So what is the answer for that? I don't have the answer for that question. That's a, that's a community thing. Again, that I, I like to, to refer things to the community and, and see where the community goes. People have come to me with so many topics over the years. Like I'll give you an example, the exotic. They came to me, that, why don't you want to register the exotic? Well, first of all, Where's this club that is working with the exotic? That's writing a standard for the exotic. That's that's giving this, uh, uh, you know, creating a breed saying this is the purpose of the breed. Here's a general impression of the breed. Here's a standard for the breed. Here's generations of breeding for this particular standard. And you know, nobody ever came to us and said, "Hey, this is what we have." You know, it never worked out that way. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's like a lot of times people don't understand like our standpoint. It's like we're not hating on anybody, but if you're going to do something, do it the proper way. What right. you're talking about is breeding actual American bullies at a height shorter than what's already there. And the only answers for that is new breed, which doesn't quite make sense because it's still an American right. bully. Exactly. Changing the height <clears throat> regimen, which uh-huh. again, either gives you too many, too broad of a regimen right. of seven inches, which doesn't make sense. Uh, adding a gap and moving the pocket down in height, moving the XL up in height, then you fall with the scenario of all these dogs that fell in between it, have nowhere to compete, or adding a whole nother variety to the breed, but then again, you're expanding the breed into to more directions. Right. What's the proper answer? I personally don't have the answer. At the moment, we stand behind mm-hmm. what we have because this is what we offer. What right. the community can talk about, and that's a great topic for the community, and it's you know it's something to do, but you have to look at it from the registry standpoint and say how does it make sense, you know? Well, I think it would make sense when there's enough consistency throughout and enough to justify a class, right? I think that's when it would make sense, but as of right now, it's um, it is a very trendy style of dog Um, not everybody does it correctly Um, not all of them fit confirmation you know so and and that's that's other thing because consistency doesn't necessarily mean good at all right consistency just means alike you know so we can Mm -hmm. say hey we got this consistency in this particular thing but it could still be something that's that's not quality or you know what i mean it could be something that's not like you know, and I hate to, to use the exotic as a reference because I think people think I hate on it, but there's so many qualities that were wrong. And even if you have consistency, but with things that are wrong, that are detrimental to the health of a dog and all these other things, you can be consistent on that, but it doesn't mean that's correct, you know? Right. And I'm assuming what you're saying is consistency, but still consistent to what is still actually the American bully. The standard, right, for the American right. bully and looking at health and everything, you know, right longevity mobility all these things looking at all these things and saying it and if that's the way you're saying it then i understand that but at the same time do we necessarily add something more for that because now you are separating your breed even further into more categories and more things and at Mm -hmm. some point when is enough enough is a true question enough is enough when something's wrong that is hindering something but when is enough is enough when it's just adding something else i don't know right 
I don't right. have the answer to that question, you know. So. And, and I think another thing that really applies, it would be just like if we added the extreme class back in, right? If you added the extreme class, you would get some desirable dogs show up. And then you would get some dogs that just because you meet the height qualification, uh, right. let's say you move the pocket class down <clears throat> an inch or whatever, right? It opens the door and allows people to bring these dogs in they still have to move like an American bully, which is extremely hard for a dog that's shorter than the cutoff. Oh, so right. yeah, we may open the door and let them in, but at the same time, you still need to be able to bring that movement and that structure requirement. That is the American bully. So a hundred percent. And that's part of what I was saying. Can they actually fit into that standard? So, but you, you do, when you open the door, you also add confusion and, you open it to so many things. So, I mean, it's very difficult to, to say I'm the opposite. I think that you tighten things up and I feel like you, you have to have an identity. And when you start doing too many things, you start to lose your identity, you know, because mm -hmm. now you've just got so many variations of this, you know, and how many variations does it take to, to lose the stability and identity of a breed? And, you know, and I think as, as a breeder, I would say to those people, yeah, like if they could open the door and let you come in, but mm -hmm. also the other thing you have to consider is the ramifications right now, what works for you and sells you stud credits and sells you puppies, right? It's possible that you could bring those dogs into ring and you could start to receive some negative feedback that you've never received before, you know, because your dog is a class of dog that's never been in the ring. And it has its own following, you know what I mean? So it, it's a trade-off. It's like, what you got? Uh, what, but, what, you know, negative feedback is something that AVKC has been dealing with. This whole breed has been dealing with since the beginning, right? Right. Well, um, we, dealt, we dealt with a different type of negative feedback in the beginning. People that didn't feel this breed should exist at all. It's, right, it's right. crazy how it flipped around because in the beginning, it was the outside world against us. Now it's us against yeah. us. And it's kind of a, mm -hmm. a I hate to do this to y'all. Can I can I step away for one second? I gotta let the dog in the dog and bark. Oh, of time. course. Yeah. Y'all sure. should debate that yeah. one back and forth because you're doing good without me on that one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> one second, I'll be right back. Yeah. But you get I mean, one this this you get one this breed has faced adversity since its conception, <laughs> you know. No, but you get what I'm saying. Like I have I tend to have bigger dogs, right? Mm -hmm. So but I know that I have dogs that do well in the realm of being a stud dog. And I know if I brought that particular dog to the show ring and let not necessarily the judges in the ring, but the right. judges outside the ring, you know, it would be detrimental. It would be detrimental. Right. And I think my point there was like, do you just, do you want to put yourself in that position in the first place? That's that question. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, if they do introduce the extreme class, like what are the height requirements, you know? Mm -hmm. And then so, uh, like, uh, somebody had said, somebody had asked me to show seven and he is in the kennel. And uh -huh. I'm not going to bring him in here and have him knock my table over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> try to sit in your lap. Like people don't realize how much of a, that's a lot of dog to be running around your house for sure. Okay, so Dave, I got another question for you. I saw it in the comments a couple of times. It's been brought up over and over, and I don't know if it's something the ABKC is ready to discuss yet, but I want to put it out there and see you know, if it's something we we're going to talk about, and that is bringing the Merle into ABKC. So again, that's, that is a, a heated topic on all ends. It's, uh, I will explain it to you like this, because... A lot of times the things I say are misinterpreted or somebody takes them and runs with them. Like somebody tonight, right. somebody tonight, a hundred percent sure is going to say, Dave said, we need to have the extreme class in here and we need flawed dogs in the ring. And it's, you know, somebody's going to take it and run with the, and not what right. I truly said. And it's going to yeah, happen. The, I already know that. The next class in the ABKC is yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, so, it's, and it happens to me all the time. I can tell you history. And when I tell you history, I'm telling you truth because this is just history. When we started the American Bully Breed, there were Merle Breeders. They were there. Um, there were some in the Elite Age. Not popular, but they were there. 
So when we opened up the stud books to the American Bully breed, Merles were in the breed at the time. Regardless of who wants to argue the ancestry of that is different, but it doesn't matter because once it's in the stud books of our, our, our breed, then that is the foundation of the breed. So there were Merles in the American Bully breed since its inception. What happened is along the way, years down the road, the UKC said, hey, we're going to stop allowing Merles to compete and then eventually breed whatever they did, you know. And the reason they said that was because they felt that the Merle gene wasn't true in the American people, whatever, you know, but there were Merle. So I don't, I don't know where they came to the final conclusion, but that's their research. The ADBA followed and said, we're going to stop allowing Merle's too, but it's not. And they were clear. They said, not because it's not in the ancestry, because we feel there's health things that are mm -hmm. uh, affiliated with the breed. So we stopped. Mm -hmm. Then there was a public push for us to do the same thing. And we used to work on a panel of, you know, we still have a panel, but we had a, a panel at the time that voted on it. And the majority, I personally said, I I'm not here nor there on it. I mean, it's been here. We're not seeing a lot of genetic defects in these dogs, but at the same time, we weren't seeing many of them, period. So, you know, really kind oh. of, uh, you know, and I didn't know enough about it. Honestly, I hadn't really, it was never on my radar. It was always there, but it wasn't on the radar. So, I, the vote anyway said, you know what, we're going to stop allowing them for competition. We'll grandfather it in for registration, but we're not going to have it for competition. And that's the way that went in ABKC in 2018, I believe, 19. And I don't know what year again. That's the way it went. Some people argue, why would you do this? Why would you do that? That's the way the vote went. Many, many breeds and registries have colors or patterns mm -hmm. that they don't allow for competition, but they still register. For a long time, the French Bulldog allowed blues and other things, but you just couldn't show. You know, there's all kinds of breeds that have these scenarios. Right. So it's not an abnormal scenario to make it a DQ for competition, but still allow for registration. Um, anyway, that's the way it went. I'm just telling the history. So, and it's, it's not debatable because this is actual history, you know. Now, where we are today, the argument really in our breed no longer is more, is it a health hindrance? Is there, are these health issues something that can be avoidable in breeding? The consensus says, and this is what people say, so don't get upset with me, anybody out there, but the consensus says that the breeders in the American bully aren't ready to be breeding things that are going to take a little bit more work because they've already got other issues going on in the breed that they can't fix. This is what people are saying. This is their argument. They're saying, and now they're seeing there are Merle breeders out there that have good programs that are breeding dogs that are not having the, the, the issues. You know, they might still have the issues genetically. Yes, that could pass on. I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but I'm saying they have programs that you're not, they're not producing these dogs that are having these issues with blindness and, and all the other things associated with, with the Merle gene, right? So the proof is there now that it can be bred. Other breeds have proven this for many years. The Catahoula mm -hmm. was a breed that's almost right. a completely Merle breed. I mean, there's our breeds that can prove that if bred right. properly, we can bypass them. Are they more susceptible to it? Probably still, but that's no different than like blue dogs are in our time too. You know, blue dogs <sighs> are considered to have more issues with mange and other things like that, you know. Right. Skin it's issues, just, yeah. Yeah, skin issues. But we we did also prove that, yeah, you can breed these dogs without these things if you do it properly. There right. are Merle breeders out there proving it now saying, yes, here we are, and we're not producing this. But the consensus is saying that our community isn't ready to take on something like that because we mess things up anyway. And that's that's the argument I hear all the time. Oh, breeders aren't ready. Our breeders can't even produce the American bully without issues. And now adding something in that's more susceptible to this is going to be even worse to the breed because so they're blaming the breeders by saying your breeders aren't ready. However, some breeders have now stepped up and said, we are ready. So the question is, mm -hmm. now do we say, because some of you have proven that you can, we still feel the majority can't, so we're going to leave it that way. So here's what we're doing as ABKC. Same thing we're doing with the extreme. We're opening up the fun show side of it. We're allowing mm -hmm. the Merles to come in that are ABKC registered to come into these events and give them their moment in, in the ring at a fun show, not a confirmation show, for the public to see and let the public at least see both sides of the equation see it. You've heard the argument against it. Now let's show you. They're, they're here in the breed. So the argument of whether they're here or not here is mute because right. they're here in the breed. They are registered. 
they're there. So the question is, do we continue to keep it as a DQ? Do we end up getting stricter and saying not only is a DQ, but now we're not even going to register them? Or do we remove the DQ and allow them to compete? These are your three scenarios. Don't say Dave Wilson saying one to the people out there. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm just putting the three scenarios out there. These are the right. only three scenarios there are. So as ABKC, we're saying we're going to allow their register with us. We're going to allow fun shows at the events for these dogs so the public can actually see for themselves. And at least now you're getting a broader view of what's out there and giving the breeders that are doing it properly an opportunity to show that they're doing it properly. Whether we change or not isn't what we're doing this for at this moment. We're doing it for the public to be able to see this and these breeders to be at least display their dogs and say, look, we're proving that we are capable of doing this. And there are plenty of us that feel are doing it. And if that's the case, you know, and it is a divided thing. You'll hear half the people like, ah, you know, like they're crazy about it. Like there's no way that in the other half that's, you know, this, and you know, again, it's, it's, they're already registered. So we are opening up the fun show side of it. So at least they can be seen at their best and people can, make their conclusion from that. It can be a topic of community debate after that. And, you know, right. and that's kind of what I want. I, I would like to see the debate go on in the community on both sides, but at least accurate. At one point you only have one side of the equation. Now you have the other side. So see where it goes. Yeah. So thing for is, me, the dog oh, exists, it's out there and people are yeah. reading it. So it's not like if the ABKC said, we're going to let, the merle in the ring that people would drop everything and start breeding the merle the only thing it would do would be attract right. people that have already been breeding the merle it's it, not it, like you know well, jack smith is going to say screw these regular bullies i'm going to start breeding merles now you know you're just attracting yeah. people that have been excluded and including them and they're and going I, to I, I got to clarify one more thing, too, because I heard people say, oh, ABKC is about money. They're doing this for money. Let me explain something to everybody out here. We don't make money on dog shows. The host, all that goes to a host. So if the Merle was ever allowed to compete, that doesn't change the element of finances for ABKC. The host, yes, because you have more entries, you know, but it doesn't change it. The registration was already there. So there's no financial investment on any side of this. It doesn't affect right. us any way financially. Uh, one end financially, the dogs are already registered. So the money that would go to ABKC is, is a registration. ABKC is only based on registration. You know, right. if you know about dog shows, entries in a dog show go to the host. The fee for a judge, the fee for a rep goes directly to the, you know, there's no profit side of a dog show to ABKC. So it doesn't, I just want to clarify that side of it. So we don't have a financial interest that m makes a difference. You know, it's it's truly what is right. And it's truly a community debate. They're already there. We're, we're, we're giving the opportunity to at least bring them to the events now and say, see for yourself. And I will tell you, I've been watching this for a long time. And there are breeders that have some quality dogs. I mean, they're there. I've seen them, you know. And I've actually seen in the XL, which in my opinion is the weakest variety representing the, the true standard in, in the American Bully. We can all agree that when we're looking overall at the XL, they're mo a good portion of those dogs don't fit the actual standard of the American bully breed, especially in general impression. It's still in development. They're getting there. When I've gone overseas, some of the best XLs I've seen that fit the standard are actually Merle's, which I don't know why it's that way, but there's a lot of them that are that way. So, and, and another quick thing on the XL, what we see in the ABKC world, the XL community is way larger than what we all see in our, in our world in confirmation. Oh, world. yeah. Right. Behind the scenes, the XL is a huge variety of the American Bully breed. It's just we're not seeing them face to face because they're not attending the dog shows, but mm -hmm. they're registered and they're a huge portion of this breed, more than most people think. And that's aside from Murrow. I was just throwing that bit of information out there because I think a lot of people don't realize that their XL is really a big category in our breed. It's just we're not yeah. seeing them at the shows. And why, I don't know. That's another thing. Now, do you think that is that's part of is like their community says this is what the dog should look like, and ABKC says this is what the dog, and it does they don't necessarily match up, so they just don't bring them. Or I, what do you I, think the factor is, I honestly believe because they have a market outside of the confirmation ring for mm -hmm. these dogs, kind of mm -hmm. like some of the extremes, kind of like the exotic. There's a market there. 
Yeah. And they have a where the dogs are selling for high dollar quality ones. And in, in certain breeders, confirmation isn't important because if they have their market, they're selling right or wrong. I mean, I, I, I still think confirmation ring is the important part because it displays the proper part of our breed. But right. you also can't deny the the reality of things. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm right. a realist, so I'm not going to tell you how yeah. it is. I honestly believe it's because they have a market. And in their market, the confirmation ring, unfortunately, isn't a, a necessity. You right. know? Well, um, and, and ideally, you know, in my opinion, I want to breed a dog that people want. Right? I also want to breed a dog that's confirmationally correct. But that means it's a dog that's confirmationally correct and you know, by some people's standards, extreme, you know, that's the picture of the American bully for me. And, and ideally it should be correct. And what people want, ideally that's what it right. should be. Right. Well, I'm not saying these XLs aren't confirmationally correct. I'm just saying that they have a market for them, whether they're in the ring or not, you know, right there. Cause I imagine I've seen some photos of some very nice XLs and they just don't, they don't show. Mm. And obviously, obviously confirmationally they were, there's been a few I've seen that I was extremely impressed with. Like to breed, really, I think a lot of people don't even have that concept. Like if you took the standard that applies to the standard and applies to the pocket and you made the XL look like that, that would be a ridiculously massive dog. Like just mm -hmm. unreal how big that dog would be. So I'm in, I've seen a couple of them here and there and I'm like, it's, 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 uh, I couldn't have them. I love them. I actually, well, that, that would be like taking seven. And increasing his height by three inches, well, but while increasing the height, right. every every other aspect of them is also being increased. Yeah, that's proportionally yeah. increased. Yeah. It would be that's insane. Big, yeah. Uh, yeah, it would be crazy. That's like a, that's, that's that's what like it's a, a barbarol. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you added an extra syllable in there, but I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, folks, if you have any other questions, go ahead and throw them in the comment uh, so we can we can you know throw some of these. My, my opinion. On the my opinion on the Merle is um, if it's a badass dog, the last thing I look at is the coat or the pattern. You know, I, I look at the bowl for what it is, you know. Um, and if it checks all the boxes, but it has a candy paint job, I'm okay with it. Yeah, you know? I mean, but the it's, real it's gonna fit the health effects that are related. Right. To to the gene because in essence it's a pattern, but in essence it's considered almost like a condition. So it's hard to it's hard to argue on some end of it. But the same thing. The other thing goes that all the research that has been done on Merle's over the years, a lot of it has come from breeds that were overbred anyway. So it's like mm -hmm. you know, it's it's difficult because in some breeds they got issues that other breeds don't have because they're overbred. So it's it's a, it's a hard one, man. It's and and please. Whoever watches this tonight, don't take me wrong. I'm not telling you that breed right. murder. I'm not telling you that we're saying breed extremes. I'm just telling you the reality of the whole picture of everything. You know, I still mm -hmm. firmly believe that confirmation is key and that we should all be breeding towards the standard. But I really do emphasize that breeding towards the standard doesn't necessarily mean all your dogs fit the standard. Breeding towards the standard means you have different dogs that are producing dogs that fit the standard. That's what that means. And when we look at the standard, once again, the very first part of the standard that refers to the general impression is the beginning of where you start with your dogs. That is the what identifies your dog for what breed or what variety it is. That's the beginning. When I, If I were a judge, I would tell you too like this. If I were a judge and the dogs oh, walk the ring, the first thing I would do would eliminate every dog that doesn't fit general impression in my mind these dogs are no longer awardable period that's the first step now what's remaining i'm eliminating every dog that has a severe flaw a flaw that you can see from outside the ring you know severe things like this i'm eliminating all of these dogs whatever is left after those two eliminations this is where i'm judging the dogs now you know and that's that's where I would go. Unfortunately, the reality of it is, and I hate to say this because people get offended. The reality of it is, if you were that strict, you would barely have any dogs in the show ring, period. Mm -hmm. and, and really, it's true. anybody who it's wants true. to contradict that, stand there ringside. Watch every dog that comes in the ring. Eliminate everyone that doesn't fit general impression. Do that. 
Then eliminate everyone that's not carrying a flaw that you can visibly see from outside the ring. Do that. And then you tell yourself how many dogs are left in the ring. That's the reality of where the breed is and the reality of where judges are having to work with. And imagine if judges were that strict at this moment. We would probably end the dog show. Yeah. Yeah, Nobody's going back. It's a fine line. It's like, I I hate to be the one to say this, but I tell people all the time, we need better quality dogs in the ring. Before you can be so critical on judging and all these things, let's increase the quality first. Once the quality is there and consistently there, so the quality and the consistency of the quality is there, that's the moment that you turn around and get critical on how the dogs, you know, the judges and all these other things. But until that's there, it's, it's, it's a very difficult task because if you do it the way I would do it, I would never be a judge. I'd be the most hated person yeah. in the world, you know? And I already have enough hate as it is, so I definitely don't want that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I did want to bring up that, that scenario of, of judges. Uh, you know, the your ABKC is adding judges and the new generation of judge, uh, from what I'm observing, the new generation of judge seems to uh, bre- or seems to judge a little different than a segment of your older judges. Um, so these are judges that are more focused on that uh, phenotype and they want mm-hmm. movement, they want structure, but they are focused on phenotype. Is that where they continue with ABKC will continue to do is just filter in these that that newer generation. They're really focusing on that. Well, here's the thing is that whenever we look at a new generation period, they are more adapt to seeing where things are in the present because they are the present. They are the new generation. We're not talking judges at the moment. I'm just talking in general in life. Right. When you have someone that's been around for a long period of time, they've seen generational changes. And when you see generational changes, doesn't necessarily mean you're seeing everything in the moment. So new, the newer generations are seeing the moment, you know? So now when we're looking at the breed and, and hear me the, completely out with this. Now that we're looking at the breed, we've gone through a long period of time of progression. And now we're in the moment that we're in. So a younger generation is obviously going to be more observant of the moment we're in because that's the moment that they've come into, you know, and every generation is going to be that way. There shouldn't be any inconsistencies, though. The older judges really should have followed the, the, the progression of the breed. And it's really based on the standard. So in actuality, everything is based on what the standard is. So it might appear to some that the new generation is that way for whatever reason. But in actuality, they're really all going on the standard. So I don't necessarily see it as that way. Um, I think sometimes a younger eye is seeing more of the present, you know, I mean, and that's just natural, but overall, I don't, you know, I mean, we look at a lot of these judges. We'll, we'll use John Ronaker, for instance, John Ronaker has been here from the beginning and, and, you know, he, he's a judge that, that is known for, for dogs that are carrying a, you know, heavy phenotype, you know, the thing is, it's not about who you were and where you were. In reality, the problem is there's an inconsistency in the ring. And when you have an inconsistency in the ring, you're going to have an inconsistency of choices because they only can work with what's available. And that's that. If they're too strict, then they're eliminating everything. So you're going to have some that are going to say, I'm reading general impression. This is the most important because this identifies what our breed or our variety is. Now let's get into everything else. You're going to have others that are saying, I'm balancing everything out because this is a balance. And in actuality, it's very difficult in some aspects because truly general impression is a little bit different. General impression is the breed. That's the essence. So that is the most important. That's the essence. And everything else is starting to get critical along the way. Right. No judge is wrong. The problem is the breed as itself right now isn't consistent enough in, in the quality that give a clear guideline for everybody to say, boom, 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 because it's just not there. So it's like step in the ring and do what I just said. And you tell me what's left when you're, when you look at it through the eyes that I told you, and it's, it's hard. So I don't really see it quite the way that you said it. I understand the younger generation seeing more in the moment and all of that, but I don't necessarily think that that's truly the case in the judges. Cause for every instance that you could say, we could pick another one. that's not that, you know, which I just did. You know, so I think really, 
I, I don't think the at this moment the time is to focus on judges. At the time is to focus on the breed. Right. The time is I think the quality that, and consistency of the breed. We update our judges. We train our judges. You know, we the, our judges are not just walking in the ring picking what they is their favorite dog. They have a guideline. They it's not just it's not so easy to be an ABKC judge. I mean, first you have to meet the criteria, and then once you've met the criteria, which involves produ production, handling, all these things of champion dogs, you know, titled dogs. Then you go through a testing process, which which you have to learn the standards, read the standards, be tested on the standards. And then even after that, you have to go through the apprenticeship thing. We have to go into the ring with three of it and you have to pass the, all of these levels to get there. So yeah. they're all very well trained. Um, it's just I really believe right now that the issue is the overall consistency of quality of the breed. And it's and it's just the way it is. And, you know, until you have everything ticking, every part of the standard, you, you're never going to complete consistency because what's to say you got two dogs that are almost identical and everything but this one has this flaw this one has this flaw who's to say that this flaw is is stronger than this flaw? i mean if they're both flaws they're both flaws and if every dog in the ring has flaws but you got two dogs that are equal in every other element other than this one's got this one and this one's got this one mm -hmm. how do you make that decision and and that's why you're going to have some inconsistency it's just the way it is there's an inconsistency of quality once the quality is there, then you can actually evaluate and say something's missing here or something, you know, but mm -hmm. I don't see that. And we do take all these things into consideration. We do listen to all the complaints and we do all that. But it's it's very difficult when you go to a ring and, and you're watching and it's like, you know, I, I get it. You know, and, and I tell you, almost every incident I've ever confronted a judge, a judge they've given me a, a good reason to what they've done. And, you know, and if they didn't, you know, then there would be some type of system where we would remove a judge and we have removed judges over the years we're just not public about it you know right yeah and i guess um just to correct myself i mean saying older probably wasn't because you know the reality of it is, is i've had the opportunity to sit down with some of your original judges we're talking yeah. about your first five judges and and have that conversation so you know when i was very new i was looking for guidance but i wasn't looking for it just in the wide open i was looking for very specific guidance and i had the opportunity to sit down with three or four of your very original judges the very first ones and you know use their advice right and then as things developed that's when i started to realize that yeah these guys you know gave me this advice but not every judge necessarily sees it that way um some may lean you know, in one direction more than the other. Right. And I think that's just a, a factor within, within the, within the breed. It's just and and that, that falls back on the dogs because right. whether some judges lean one way or the other way, the problem is, is that why they're having to lean is because there's equal issues in what's out there. You know what I mean? That's why you, there's going to always be some type of leaning because everything has equal issues. Mm -hmm. At that point, I mean, ideally, the right thing is to say nobody gets awarded. But let's be realistic. Yes. If you really do it that way, I mean, really, if you're saying if a dog with a flaw can't be awarded, then it, it's going to almost eliminate 90, 95 percent of the ring. Right. You no, know? because it's still a it's still a it's, progressive breed. Yeah, hundred you know? percent there, and it, it's very difficult to explain that because, like, but your standard says it. Yeah, it says this. However, let's look at it. This one also right. has this. This one also has this. You're right. you're saying oh, this particular dog has this, but look at the other one. It's got this, you know. So it's like until they're all out there and they don't have that, it's very difficult, you know. And and you can't be so strict on a young breed to the point that you're eliminating every dog. You can't, you right. know. Even even our top dogs still have something you can pick on them, because that's where we are in the breed at this moment. We're still not there where you can't say, you know, this didn't have this, and even. The breeds that have been around for 100 years, you still run into those type of things, you know, that you're still not looking at a completely flawless ring of dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah. I'll tell you, flawless doesn't, people saying flawless doesn't exist is wrong. Flawless can exist and should exist. Yeah. You know, it's preference that, you know, well, uh, perfection that doesn't exist because that is a preference thing, you know. Right. But, and it's just about, it's about perception too. Uh, I'll give you the example. We have, we have a friend that she has a very nice dog. And uh, I remember we recommended she put the dog in the classic class. And then, you know, we were at we were at nationals and a, and a breeder 
came up to me as the dog left the ring and he was like that dog is not a classic and i said compared to what like how how can you say a dog's not me if if i look at a dog of mine let's say i look at seven and then i look at that dog then to me that dog is a classic that's my perception of it mm -hmm. right but, but someone that has a dog that maybe has less mass and bone than that dog has they would say that dog's not a classic it's a standard so that's a perception issue that we have to deal with in the community is my perception of what a classic is versus what some others perception of what a classic is mm -hmm. right and there's some leeway in judging also in the same way you know what i mean at what point does a dog have too much mass or too much bone to be considered a classic and be bumped into the standard class where he might not actually fit very well either. Yeah, yeah. and see, so you'll yeah. never solve that completely until you mm -hmm. get into where you're, you have weight regimens and you have measurement regimens and you have all of these things that say the head has to be between this inch and this inch compared right. to the height. And this, you know, I mean, it's like once you get into that, the dog's supposed to weigh between this and this. That is when you can get into that side of it. The problem is this breed is again, it's still way imagine right now. If we say the dogs can only weigh the standard dogs need to be between 75 and 85 pounds. They're not ready to put that on them at this point in time. The breed's not ready. If you're saying the standard head has to be between 24 and 26 inches, it's not ready to go that level yet. But that's what we talked about earlier about the standard. When we talk about the standard saying that we've added a revision to the standard later on, the revision to the standard was to make things stricter. You know what I mean? Put tighter guidelines on things. As a breed progresses years down the road, becomes more consistent, is a time when you will add more revisions. You would, shouldn't change the standard, but you should revise the standard when you're creating a breed and the breed is progressing over the years because you have to eventually add more guidelines, more things that identify every aspect of the breed. Down the road, you should have weight added. Down the road, you should have some of the measurements added to the breed. These are things in the future that should be implemented. They're ju it's just too young at this moment to implement those mm -hmm. things. Imagine going to a show right now and they're pulling out a myotape on every dog's head. Yeah. It would take forever. I mean, it'd take forever. You know, I mean, and it's not there yet. Imagine bringing the scale out for every single dog walking in the ring and you're met. You know, it's like we are just aren't there yet. When the breed gets more consistent, then you can start to add these things, right. you know, and, and that's down the road. Right. And, and, you know, we, we live in a world of instant gratification where we want it all now. And ever since Amazon's there, we expect it like, boom, you want right. to boom that there next day. You know, we're building something. And no matter what anybody says, and I hear some people talk, oh, no, no, Dave's wrong. We're already there. Sorry, I'm going to say it this way. Bullshit. We're not there. Right. You know, we're not even that close. We are not ready to put the weight regimens on the dogs. We're not ready to put the head sizes. And so once we do those things, then, yeah, then at that point, you know, it's even more clear. But it's a process. And the breed has and the quality is different. So I stand behind all of my judges. I have. If we've ever had an issue with a judge that was a true issue, we remove the judge. So every judge that you see that's still there, it's because we stand behind them and they're doing what they're supposed to do. You know, so I have no issue with our judges. As far as the inconsistency, let's be real, there's an inconsistency of quality. And that's where the problem starts. Right. And once that changes, then you can look further into things like that, you know. But I think we're doing good. And I do believe that if you step back and watch the progression over the years with the judges, choices, and the breeds, the judges are helping the breed evolve into what it's supposed to be. Evolve probably not the right word, but helping the breed get to where the standard is saying that it should be. You know, And that's really what is happening. It is happening. And, and little by little, you're seeing, and you go to a show now, I promise you, what you see in the ring is different than what you saw seven years ago. It is working. It's just a process, right. yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. And the and the goal was the yeah, just like you said about the measurements and everything is to get more finite, not exactly. less. You know. Right. So yeah, we have a. Someone mentioned something about why can't we just eliminate the classic class and put the dogs all in the ring together or whatever? But that would make it less finite. What we really want is more finite. We really exactly. want to get to the point where we can measure leg bone and say this dog is within the limit or a head right. size, and this dog is within the limit.
Yeah. yeah. So that's the long. We're just, we're, that's the long. Yeah. That's the, the big picture in the long run. And we're just not there yet because if you do it right now, it's, it's all over the place with the speed right now. It's not, it's not ready there. And you ain't never yeah. going home. You ain't getting past show one. If we do it right now, <laughs> it'll be midnight by the time show one ends, you know? So, yeah. 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 So, yeah. For sure. For sure. All right. Well, you know what? I've, I think uh, we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, I really, as far as the questions I wanted to ask, we definitely did. We got that out there. And I think I'm looking forward to seeing some of those changes as far as, you know, bringing those bigger dogs to the, to the shows, not the ring necessarily, but the shows mm -hmm. and uh, giving them yeah. the exposure they need. It really sends a message to the community that these are tools that we can use. These are tools we should be using. Right. Um, and I think that was a smart move on the, on the, on the oh, yeah. part of ABK. Um, I'm bringing Oscar's brother to Jacksonville. There you go. Well, you know, Hans, the other thing, too, is that you mentioned the smaller dogs. If there's yeah. a push for it, then they have a push for it to be represented in the fun shows at the ABKs. At least if you if there's that right. big of a community that feels it, the way to bring about change or bring about awareness is to push for at least an opportunity to display it. doesn't necessarily right. mean it'll be turned into something, but at least – is mm -hmm. there to be seen. So that's the best advice so, I can give you on that, you know? And that's what we're going to do in Jacksonville. We're going to bring our smallest American bully and our biggest American bully. Yeah, well, let's see. And, and, and the other thing, too, we got to be careful. We, I don't want to step into a world that we're just doing a participation award. Right. Right. Because if you, if you get into that world, in the end, you're never going to get anywhere. It's just going to be a gray world, and you'll never establish consistency ever. So we are trying to find the best way to establish consistency and quality in the American bully breed. And not everybody's going to agree, but the reason not everybody agrees is because everybody has their own opinion on what something should be. Right. So, you know, right. oh, we're yeah. doing the best we can. We will never stop listening to our community. We'll never stop trying to figure out the best scenario for our breed. The most important with ABKC is the preservation of the breed in the future. We need to make yeah. sure that a hundred years from now, the American Bully breed is still a strong, viable breed. And that's yeah. what we're trying to do. So, yeah. and that, that is our, our whole mission is to make sure that this breed continues on for the future generations. Right. And please, again, anybody that's don't misquote me, people out there think that I'm saying tonight, I gave you the actual truth of everything where it is in a non-biased way so at least you can say let's look at the whole picture you know right. not necessarily everything i said is abkc some things i said is dave wilson the breeder some things i'm just saying just to say hey this is out there so let's look at it and see what you all at least see it when it's there you know right i think you know the bully community overall is a vibrant like very broad community and doing whatever we can do to get people back together or together in one place to have open conversations is a good thing. You know, well, that, that was the essence of what really created the American bully. And I'm sorry to take up more time. It's got, but I do got to say this oh. is we didn't just start for a breed. We started for people too, because so many of us were in places that we weren't felt welcome. There's a lot of people that, didn't feel welcome here, that were discriminated against here, that all of these different things kept from bringing people together. When we started this, it was because it was an open door to everybody for the love of the dogs. There were no stereotypes, nothing mattered. All these things that happen in the world that between race, religion, region, nationality, all these things that people have issues for some reason with, that doesn't fly here in the American bully world. We're a family that are a family for our dogs. And that's why we started. And that is why this thing actually spread. That's why it became so infectious is beyond just the dogs. It was the fact that we opened the doors to everybody and everybody was welcome here. Everybody, no matter who you were, if you love these dogs, you are welcome here, your family. And that's that there's nothing to it. That was the essence of what started ABKC. That was the essence of what started the American bully. Sometimes we get so caught up that we forget what actually created this entire thing. And what created it was the fact that we all came together in unity for one love and nothing else mattered. We were family. And once we start losing that, we're losing the essence of what we were created. And it will become 
or time. You will see that the more hate that's brought into this, the more separation that's brought into us, the more division that's brought into us, eventually breaks down the core of what something is. And our core was the fact that we came together for one love. So I hope people at some point step back and realize this is actually what created ABKC, American Bully, them, you know, all this stuff. So right. I think that was awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. I, I do have one final question. Um, oh, somebody turn on the, the in, <laughs> So is Houston officially ABKC National? I got to explain this because there's so many misconceptions right. about that. Uh, I've even heard Dave can't go to California, all these crazy things. Here's the truth. We've had it all over America. We've had it in California right. many times. In fact, San Francisco is only a few years ago. The problem is that when we move nationals around, we always got hiccups. You know, Chicago, we didn't know was a union state. So we didn't know. We thought that the $50,000 is what we paid for a venue. Then we get there and they added an extra $30,000 of union fees that we didn't even know existed. I'm, you know, so all of a sudden we have a venue that's way priced outside of our budget. You know, we get to other places that they weren't familiar with the event and they and fell they into some of the negative hysteria around things that happened from other events and other things. And they try to stop the event in the process of us already promoting it and paying for it. We've run into other places where we couldn't act source the, the things that we needed. Cause you know, when you go to an event, you need everything from, from yeah. pipe and drape to all these things. And it's like, it wasn't easily sourceable. We've run into places that weren't possible for everybody to get there. Nationals, people come from all over the world. So it needs to be in a location where there's international airports, you know, all these other things that dogs can come direct to there. There's so many elements, a few places it worked. And I will tell you the three places that it worked were Kentucky and Atlanta and Houston. Those were the best three elements. Other venues we found didn't work. That was upstairs, unaccepted. You know, it's like so many problems we ran into. So in the end, Houston ended up being the best environment for it because everything that works works in Houston. Two international airports, hotels, restaurants, everything right there. A venue that doesn't care about anything else. They're like, no, we know you guys are good company. We know this is a great event. You can have it every year mm -hmm. right here. We're going to protect you. We know all of the other. So it's, a, it's in a way protecting the people because it's ensuring that you're going to have this quality event that's going to be secure. Nothing's going to stop you from that. And everything you need is right there. So the reason we decided on Houston is because it actually works for it. So we want to keep it in Houston because Houston actually works and we know it works. We love the idea of traveling and doing it in different places, but the reality of it is it's unstable to do it that way. And this isn't unstable. But just like AKC, they have their Westminster show at the same venue, Westminster. You know what I mean? UKC has theirs in Kalamazoo. You know, everybody has their place that they go right. every year. Houston became the best for that. You know, I mean, I would love to go to other places more, but we have shows all over America all the time anyway. The home of nationals right now, we've decided, is Houston because it works and it's stable. So, yes, but that's why. And they got Papa Joe's in the venue. And that's one of my favorite places. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right with that. Yeah. I could go get a swamp thing and walk right back in the shows. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm actually, you know, I think the first time we drove, we were like, God, that's a long way. But, you know, it's just like now it's become a, a yearly thing for us. Like we're going to Texas. And actually, we go twice a year. What was the other reason? We go, and there's another show in Texas that we go to. So. But you, you know when you oh, go there, right there. That's right Padre. there. You can walk. Once you get your hotel, you can walk everywhere you need to go. So mm -hmm. yeah. sure. No, I think uh I like it personally. The venue, I don't I don't I'd never I don't but, see it move. You also have to look at the turnout too, and you have to have a viable crowd of supporters in the area that support the event to make it a success too. And some of the other places just didn't. They didn't have the crowd either. So there, there's so many variables. Yeah, yeah. I mean well, we kind of got into that last week, uh, too, is like when you shut up, you set up your show and like, you know, whatever, West Virginia, you know, that the turnout, the people coming to at the end of the day, if you're a show organizer, you need to make money. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you need people to show up. You need people to pay to get in to see the dogs. And then you need people to bring dogs that people want to see. 
So there's that big balance. You need a, and I will tell you, Nationals is the only event we as ABKC host is the only one. And we never look at it as a profitable event because for us, this is an investment back into our community. Right. So the way I've looked at it and ABKC look at it is that you've supported this registry the whole time. So it's our job to give you a venue that's dressed up, that's, you know, great trophies that have all these things. So no matter what, it's like we're never looking at as a profitable type of event. We're looking at it as can we give you the most and there we can give you the most, you know. And that's that's what it's for. So cool. All right, folks. Well, we appreciate you guys tuning in. We're gonna let Dave go. Um uh, really 14 after nine, not too bad. He's gotta get some papa doughs. <laughs> nah, it's only 14 minutes past my bedtime, so we're good. Yeah, I hear you. But uh, if you guys would check us out on YouTube, we are going to be doing a giveaway on YouTube. So if find us on YouTube, it's youtube.com slash at the go rogue podcast. Give us a sub over there. Click the little bell so you get a notification. Joe Mills is already over there. I see his comment there. Yeah. But uh, if you listen to podcasts, you can find us on Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, you name it. We're pretty much everywhere. And we appreciate you guys tuning in. We'll see you next time. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Thank you all. Good night.